uh, the silver Lamborghini flies around the corner. From that point on, I was hooked. He walked me around the office. He's like, hey, Zoni, what'd you make this month? 150 grand. You know, hey, Jay, what'd you make last year? 3.4 million. These are guys in their 20s. This is really messed up how this whole thing went down. She uh, comes by my office and uh, and she pitches me. Everything yeah. seems legit. I start raising capital. Your guys are calling investors saying, hey, we got a new company. Here's what we need. Put in 100,000, 200,000. Something's definitely wrong. I drive to the bank and she had spent 350 grand out of that. 400,000. This is a criminal situation here. And, and our name's all over it. Royce started partying too much. You know, he stopped coming in. You know, out of the first round, that five million we raised, Royce raised twelve thousand five hundred dollars. At this point, I keep hearing it from more people that he's gonna have me killed. So I'm driving over there. I call him, meet me around the house, go in the back by the dock. He says. I start thinking to myself, I'm like that was odd. I call my girlfriend and I said, Do you think that this guy would really kill me? Yeah. What are you stupid? Turn around right now. I get a phone call. He says, Whatever you do, don't come to the office. There's like forty FBI agents here. So I booked a flight to Ecuador. I remember when I was indicted, I thought, time for a trip. We go to the airport and they close in on me. They say, excuse me, can I see your passport? Hey, this is Matt Cox, and I'm going to be doing an interview with Joseph Vitale. This is very possibly one of the best interviews and stories I've ever heard. You absolutely need to watch this video. It's got a bunch of double crosses, twists, turns, murders, several scams. It's genuinely going to be one of the better videos you will ever watch. Check it out. I grew up on uh, on Long Island. Okay. And, no. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Middle class family, right? And uh, I ended up uh, going to FAU down here in Florida. Right. And... Made it through about a year and a half. And I, I one night I met a guy driving a Lamborghini. Uh, that's how I got into the whole stock thing. Right. And well, you were, da- you were dating? This girl, Alicia. Yeah, yeah, you were dating? We were hanging out. You know, she okay. was from, she was from, I knew her from high school back up in New York. And she was down here for, uh, you know, for like a two week vacation. We were hanging out. And we went out to a restaurant. I think it was Jay Alexander's in Fort Lauderdale. And uh, she's like, come here. I want you to meet my friend, Erica. And then she starts telling me about uh, about her boyfriend, and she starts bragging about this guy. She's like so impressed, and uh, you know. So I go over, I meet them, and he's like, "How you doing? My name is Isaac Grossman." He puts his hand out, and I'm like, "I'm Joe Vitale." Right. right? <laughs> this guy's like all formal. So we uh, we had drinks, you know, for uh, you know two three hours at the restaurant, and then we we went out to some club. When we walked out of the restaurant, they're like, follow us. The guy's car comes flying out of uh, valet. And mind you, I'm like, you know, 19 year old kid uh, from New York. You don't see cars like this, you know, every day down here, they're, they're a dime a dozen. Right. So I'm like, it's, it's this Lamborghini, you know, the silver Lamborghini flies around the corner. And I'm looking at this guy, he's like probably 29, 30 years old. Um, they get in, I follow them. And then. What are you driving? Yeah, like a Volkswagen, like a beat up Volkswagen right. Passat. <laughs> the thing had like a, like a tint peeling off of it. <laughs> it was right. like, I was like putting behind them. This guy's like cutting in and out of traffic. So uh, so we followed them to a club. And I mean, I was just, I was just blown away. I'm like, how's this young guy? Usually you see, you know, old people driving yeah. nice cars, living in, you know, uh, you know, lavish lives. So this guy was, uh, you know, like I said, 29, 30. So I start asking him about uh, about what he does for a living. He explains to me the whole brokerage industry, what he does. At that time, I really didn't even understand how stocks work. Never bought a stock. Right. Never looked into stocks. Never really, you know. Had well, you were in art school, right? You wanted to be an, an artist. Yeah, right. correct. Yeah, I was going to school for graphic design. And uh, so he gives me his card. He's called me on Monday, and, you know, and, you know, we'll give you an interview. And if you have what it takes, you know, maybe you could be a part of the team. So I go down there on a Monday. I was working like two jobs at the time. I went down on a lunch break. He sat me in the uh, waiting room for about 45 minutes, my entire lunch break. And uh, the the reception, she brings me back into his office. He had this huge corner glass office. Um, I walk in and I'll never forget it. He was sitting there on the phone and he says something along the lines of, 
you know, this is Isaac Grossman, your favorite broker. Have you been? <laughs> and then he, he goes into this conversation and maybe four or five minutes on this call, he looks over at me, he winks, and then he hangs his phone up and he says, I just made $16,000 on that phone call. He's like, what'd you make today? Yeah, I think it was, I told him, I told him like 50 bucks. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, and I just lost my job for fuck because you yeah, exactly. wait 45 minutes. Yeah. So, uh, so from that point on, you know, he, he, I mean, I was, I was hooked. You know, I told myself, I can either go back to my job, go back to FAU, try to figure out a way to build a career in graphic design and, uh, which, you know, I mean, I, I had confidence in myself in that, in that field, but I knew and know that, you know, things take time. When he walked me around the office and, and he pointed out all the brokers. But you're never going to make $16,000 on a phone yeah. call. Yeah. Right. He's, he walked me around the office. He's like, uh, hey, Zoni, what'd you make this month? Uh, Zoni was like 150 grand. You know, hey, Jay, what'd you make last year? And he's like, uh, 3.4 million. These are guys in their 20s. Right. So yeah, I basically told him, I said, listen, bring me on board. I'll do whatever it takes. I mean, I'll work to learn what it is you have to say or do or know, and uh, you know, I'm at your disposal. So um, that was basically it. Then I started, you know, working in the training program with them for a couple of months, and then I got what, licensed. What was the training program though? How how did that work? The training program was like you worked. It was. I mean, I'm sorry. I remember. Cause you were like, it was, was like the whole boiler room type. Like you work for a guy under a guy for right. so long. And then at some point when you get licensed mm -hmm. and you've done, you've made so many accounts for them, Correct. then they give you right a certain amount of, so go yeah. Ahead. So the, the program worked where they would give you $200 a week, you know, like beer money. Yeah. And, uh, you would have to work under their license you know, which is obviously, a, it's, it's a violation. A lot of firms did it at that time, you know, tier two brokerage firms where they wouldn't have like, uh, you know, a, uh, any sort of analysts, they wouldn't have marketing. These were firms that were uh, specifically, you know, outbound cold calling type firms. So the training program was $200 a week. You work under my license. You know, we would make phone calls as our senior broker. And at the end of the day, we would bring them on board for a small amount of money, maybe, you know, ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000, excuse me. And uh, once they were in for that amount, right, and they had the paperwork out of the way, then they would go into the hands of the senior broker or the senior broker's partner. Uh, and then they would raise capital from the guy, trade the guy and, you know, and develop the relationship. So we had to get 50 accounts before they even uh, scheduled our test for a Series 7. And the, uh, the plan was once we passed our test, then we'd get 20 accounts back. So we would, you know, hit the ground running. Right. But uh, they never gave any back. Never right. Back. So, so how long did it take for you to raise the, the 50, to get the 50 accounts? I did it in like, it was like less than a month. I spent, I'd say from 9 a.m. to 11, maybe midnight, Monday through Friday, Saturday, I would go in the office and I would work from was it 10 to four or five uh, Sundays. You weren't supposed to make calls, but you know, we would, uh, we would tell them obviously that the scenario was that important that, uh, you know, rather than being home with uh, our wife and our newborn, that we we're here on the phone with them right. because the market still opens tomorrow morning. It, was there, was there a wife and a newborn? No, no. <laughs> So yeah, we embellished. Yeah, I mean that's the way we were taught. I mean they, you know, it was nothing. Listen, there weren't any. You don't have to apologize to me. You, you don't have to tell me. I'm with you. I <laughs> listen. When I started as a mortgage broker, I was there like 80 hours a week. I practically right. slept in the office. You could call there at 10 o'clock at night. I answered phone. Boom, Eagle Landing. Yeah, right. You know, the matter of fact, the boss they would have meetings and they would call the offices, and I would out of like they call like 20 of them, and I'd be the only one there. 10:30 at night. Yeah, boom, same, Eagle same with me. What's up? And I remember one time the guy, the owner of the company goes, what are you doing there at 1030 at night on a Friday night? And I go, I'm working. Are you the only one there? Of course, I'm the only one here. I said, do you know why I'm the only one here? And I remember he goes, he, uh, he goes, why? I go, because they're weak, bro. They're all weak. <laughs> <laughs> I, was just so, I was so into it. Yeah, right. It's like you don't feel like you're working. Yeah. I used to tell my client, I take two six-month vacations a year because I love what I do. <laughs>
but uh yeah i mean you get it it was just it's it's uh it's like a rush yeah. and when you start loving the craft it's it just becomes easy it doesn't become tiresome and you know you you're just, like the energy is just uh yeah. it's just it, I'm gonna say, especially you know, it when, you're, push. when you're the top guy when you're the top yeah. one in the office and everybody's asking you questions then it's it's yeah you right? thought i was working 60 hours i'm more now I'm, I'm up bumping it to 80. yeah like now i may get a little caught in the back i love it so much being here yeah no i mean any relationship i've ever been in since that day has always been strained because i mean i wouldn't take vacations i would hate going on vacation i mean i'd bring my laptop i'd bring my work with me i'd be on the phone half the time i mean it was uh it was like an addiction and you know i, I called it a healthy addiction but you know mm. eh. so so uh so you you got the accounts you passed your your what was it your series what uh, series? we had to take a series seven uh for stocks bonds options and then uh series 63 which was uh like blue sky so you could operate in every state okay um and did how long did you what happened at that firm did you stay at that firm um i stayed that firm was emmett a larkin and this was i believe in june of i think 05 and then i stayed at emmett larkin for probably maybe six seven eight months max uh, and then i left i left that firm i went to uh intercap wealth management with that. grossman yeah yeah okay so you went with grossman um did you guys team up and go there or what yeah he uh erica right erica his uh his mistress right she blew up his marriage right. so you the know, girlfriend well, the girlfriend that you met that you guys had lunch had lunch with was yeah. actually Grossman's girlfriend on the side, his his mistress, and yeah, his right. whole his whole his whole right. wife. She melted down the entire relationship with the yeah. It's like all the partners of the firm they lived right next door to each other, they built houses next door to each other. They were super close, and right. um, the when that happened, you know, the wives were you know they were getting in the ears of all the other partners, and they were it was just stupid. And yeah. then they fought, and um, you know they're just big egos. So he ends up blowing up one day in the office, walking out. He says, you know, Vitaly, come with me. So I walk with him and then he, uh, he basically made me a proposal and he said, I'm going somewhere and I'm going to do something big and you're the best account opener I've ever seen. You know, because by that point, the, uh, the brokers, they never taught me how to raise capital in a big way or, or, or trade stocks or I didn't even know how to write a ticket. I was just literally a trainee that got licensed and then was just a prolific account opener. So I, you know, I had the ability to make cold calls uh, and, you know, lure in new investors with relatively small dollar figures, you know, with the promise that, you know, obviously judging me on a small dollar figure, uh, you know, let that dictate the kind of performance, uh, you know, and the kind of account that we develop or whatever. And right. then they would take over. So, so, so he they basically kind of kept you there. Like why 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 let you right exactly. why move you up? This guy's fucking bringing in yeah a bunch they hold of new you they hold you down right, right. with the promise that Correct. if you keep doing well we're gonna right exactly it's all bullshit yeah. yeah so they hold you down there and then uh, when Isaac walked out and he pulled me with him he said listen there's two parts of the business obviously you have the bloodline of that business bringing in new relationships and then you know the second part which is developing those relationships so you know, you always kind of need a team uh, in some sense. And and him and I made a great team. So he said, come with me. We'll be 50-50 on everything. I'll bring my existing book of clients. We'll go over it. We'll get a fat sign on bonus somewhere. And then, uh, you know, and the rest is history. I'll teach you how to trade, how to raise. I'll teach you how to, you know, utilize analysts, the right analysts uh, going forward. And uh, and so we we went to several different interviews. We, um, we ended up at a company called Intercap Wealth Management which was in the same city, you know, just uh, maybe three, four miles from, you know, that first office. And this is Palm Beach or? No, nah, Broward County. Broward County. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, and there was, there was, there was like theatrical, the whole thing that went down uh, of onboarding us because Isaac was just, uh, he was one of the most colorful people I ever met in my life. All right. And, uh, you know, he was magnetic and a lot of people like being around him, but uh, he was like, he was kind of like Pipple too, because he would be your best friend and then out of nowhere he would just snap at you and uh and he did this several times in the negotiation with with intercap 
So they went back and forth, and then finally we came to an agreement. We started working at Intercap, and uh, uh, you know we we did pretty well pretty quickly, and uh, and you know what happened after that? Yeah, um, that well, eventually he he walks again, right? Yeah, he gets into it. He's he basically he's yeah. he's hard to get along with. Like yeah, he's yeah, very but, volatile. Yeah. But I mean, lots of guys are like that. Like, well, the, I think the problem is is what you know. I mean, I, what I notice is that you you don't really succeed without having some kind of personality defect. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah, most, really most CEOs are narcissists, you know, they, yeah. so it's like the same thing that makes them a horrible individual, uh, a, a horrible individual to be in a relationship with makes them a dynamic leader in an industry. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, you, it's such a, a hard balance. You know, you look at Trump, like, you know, he's, you know, he's a narcissist. You know what I'm saying? He's, so I'm sure he's a nightmare to have a relationship with, but yeah. let's face it, he's also winning and winning. And you know, you know what I'm saying? So it's like, it's a balancing act. It's, it's uh and yeah. the same thing with a lot of guys, a lot of salespeople. I noticed like, like they'll go up and talk to anybody. Yeah. That, and he would like dominate, he would dominate conversations, right, control right. conversations. And, Next thing and you know, like you're you giving him money. Win. You're signing over right. stuff. You're like, I love this guy. He's the, yeah, you but, would feel stupid not. Right. But then again, if things don't go his way, he could snap on you like that. Yeah. Yeah. And stab you in the back and sabotage you. <laughs> right. You know, very, uh, he was, he had psychological issues. Uh, but, you know. But isn't there, isn't there also there's yeah, he, a lot of admittedly, drugs. Admittedly, you know. Yeah. A lot of drugs in, in the industry in general. I mean. Yeah, yeah. At that time, there wasn't much of that going around uh, at that time. Okay. But then uh, after that, you know, when his marriage deteriorated, then he became pretty, pretty heavy in that stuff. So, uh, so what happened? Um, you eventually... Uh, start your own company or you went yeah i know you went somewhere else i know you went to new york for a while right didn't you go back to new york yeah uh that was when yeah our first month at intercap he negotiated like a two hundred thousand dollars sign-on bonus uh, i believe it was and then um that was really that was really the first money i made in in stocks right. believe it or not a <laughs> sign-on bonus because those se those seven or eight months at uh emmett larkin were not profitable at all I was opening accounts for people, building books of business. I'd walk into the office and, you know, my, my senior broker at that time, whoever adopted me, because I had no money, so they had to provide leads to me. And then I had to partner up with someone that knew how to actually develop, uh, you know, investors right. and, and relationships. So uh, I'd walk in the office and, you know, one day I remember my senior broker, his door was shut all day. And, you know, he never came out to give me leads. And I'm sitting in a boardroom, I'm 19 years old, 20 years old. And, you know, I'm sitting there waiting all day, knocking on his door, you know, Don, are you going to come out here? I need some leads. And they just sat in there all day, uh, never came out. So then I went home that day, like, you know, like, what the hell was that? The next day I go back into the office and, and it was the same thing. So he was in there just working. You know, his, his secretary was coming in his office. Yo, he's busy. So I start realizing like, this guy's screwing me over. Right. So I come to find out that I opened an account with some really big guy. He was some board member of some publicly traded company. He sent a bunch of money and, you know, the guy didn't want to share in the commissions. So that happened three, four times in the course of the first seven, eight months in the industry. And then when Isaac had bolted, I went with him and uh, I hadn't made any money at that point. And, you know, I was struggling. I was, I mean, literally got evicted from my apartment within that time. Uh, I had too much pride to go back to my family and, you know. I say, told Colby, you said you were like, you were like actually living in your car, sleeping yeah. at um yeah, showering yeah. at the fucking gym the whole yeah, the yeah, whole yeah. thing yeah that 200 a week paid for my dry cleaning um uh, it uh put gas in the car and uh and basically peanut butter and jelly <laughs> um, so i was willing you know i made those sacrifices yeah. because I, I i was actually i was actually going through the motions and and succeeding in doing what it took to make money but these other senior brokers just weren't sharing it with me. Yeah. When I started working at, at this place, Eagle Lending, I was two car yeah. payments behind. I used to park my car down. I used to park <laughs> it like like a couple of buildings away from where my apartment was because yeah, yeah. I thought they're coming to get it. <laughs> at some point, Ford's going to want their truck back. Did they get it? Did they no, they didn't because I ended up closing a loan. But I mean, the pressure to close that loan, yeah. you know, I, I closed a loan. I got the money. I caught it up. I, you know, and it was, but there were, there were months. Yeah. It was a you know, month and the, your, my mortgage payments. Listen, by the time I got into a position where I was making some money, I couldn't do anything with it. Nobody would lend me any money. I've been late on my mortgage payment, late on my car payment. My credit cards are behind, you know, so I mean, I know well, I, did, I didn't stay in my car, but I damn sure wasn't far from it. Yeah, no, they, uh, the, a lot of the senior brokers in that industry, what I noticed is they try to force younger guys into debt. 
right? Because you know it puts pressure on you to show up. You know those extra hours or on that Saturday, and you know they did that. And you know I, I followed suit and I got into debt. I got the nice car and you know the the nice apartment at that time. And I was you know twenty one years old with like ten grand a month in debt quickly. So uh, <clears throat> there was it was a lot of pressure to perform, and uh, it was hard to do that with Isaac. Right. But um, but we did eventually. You know, we got it together for about a year. Um, Started making some money. Yeah. We, uh, you know, we, he had, he hurt his back at, I believe, his daughter's soccer game. He was coaching the team. I think she was like, I don't know, like six, seven years old. And uh, he got hooked on like pain pills and he just totally stopped coming into work. And that's what actually forced me to learn how to raise capital how to actually have conversations with these investors, you know, not just uh, plow through them and, and uh, you know, and, and beat them up for a check. So, uh, you know, I had, I had heard him enough times to start to do it on my own. And uh, you know, he it's, it was odd because he was a little bitter about it. But, I mean, that was literally making us money. He was just sitting home and, you know, he got real burnt out on that whole thing. Um, and then eventually the firm, uh, the management came to us and they had issues with him not showing up and you know it was really on on uh the 24 the principal of the firm him and i had a good relationship and he's like he kept coming to me like you know why are you doing this like you know a lot half these tickets are they're they're, they're they got his name on it right like his rep number and i said you know he's working from home and you know and he knew that wasn't the case so it became an issue and and then again they wanted to let us go because, you know, he just, he wasn't showing up and living up to his, uh, you know, what they call fiduciary responsibility. Right. And I was running everything. I was, I was recruiting brokers. I was training them. I was opening accounts. I'd run back into the, you know, the private office and, you know, I, I'd, I'd call the investors. I'd, uh, you know, I'd trade. I'd try to put strategies together for them. It just, it was like an 18 hour a day job. So, uh, yeah, he did it again. All right. So, so at some point you go to New York and yeah. So they, uh, so they fire both of us, and you know I had enough of Isaac. I told him I said, listen, this is the third place that we're at, and you just seem to piss everybody off. It's impossible to work with you. So I went back to the owner of that firm, who uh, I called him up one day. He was in Brooklyn, in New York. They had a branch up there, and I, I negotiated my job back uh, with the uh with the idea that i would be under his supervision because when when you work at any brokerage firm typically the investors or the clientele they're the property of the firm and they didn't want to let one guy go and then have one guy here in fear of me just kind of funneling out property right. of the firm yeah he goes and, and starts his own place and right, you start exactly. sending him people exactly. until eventually you've got enough a right. big a large enough pick of business to leave yourself exactly so right. so i went up to new york uh on probation he said, uh, just come up here, stay up here for, you know, 30, 60, 90 days, whatever. We'll see how it goes. And, you know, you can learn a few things. Uh, it'll be good for you. And, uh, you know, you'll be, uh, you know, one of the guys up here. So, so I go up there and he's like, he told me that I could stay with his cousin, this guy, Dimitri. And I remember I get out. So I bring one of my cold callers with me. Okay. This guy, Matt. And we walk out from the airport. And we're getting picked up by by James's cousin Dimitri, and we get into the car, and he, he had like one of those supercharged X fives. And if you've ever been on the BQE, the Brooklyn Queens Expressway, it's super tight. Like the lanes are like probably like, I mean, it's like the, like the width of this. Right. right. Everything like you're almost you're like side swiping cars when you're driving. So he drove us to his. Uh, he had like a brownstone in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn. He drives us there at probably like 150 miles an hour. This guy. And he doesn't say one word in the car. And then this is the guy that we're staying with for, you know, one, two or three months. Right. Uh, so, you know, we got in, we got settled in and, uh, and you know, that was my home for about probably the whole 90 days. I stayed up there on, on probation. How'd you do there? I uh, did well. That was when the fi the whole financial crisis was, was settling in. So surprisingly I did, I did, those were my best months. 2008, I think it was November. Yeah. Okay. Um, so you were there for what happened? Why? So you come back to come back to Florida. 
Yeah. Start your own place, start another place, or go go to work someplace else, or did you just go, stay at the same place? No, no. I uh, So I had maybe about a six-month stretch or a seven-month stretch working without Isaac. And, I mean, I had some of my best months. So just that now, you're, now you're on your feet. Right. Now you can... Yeah, we were hitting like, you know, more than six figures a month every month. Uh, I think we hit like a half one month. And then, uh, you know, it, it, was, it, was, it was interesting because I met a group of guys that they were involved in, in startup companies. And, uh, you know, a friend of mine introduced me to a group. And as well as I was doing, when I met these guys, they were doing one, two, three million dollars a month. Right. Right. In so, in commission. Right. So yes. just for context, like after 2008, like the financial crisis, right? Like the stock market, like everything, a lot of, a lot of stuff's going to shit. Yeah. But one of the big things, so you, one of the things was that com a lot of companies were going under, but a lot of companies were starting and somebody has to get that Correct. money. Yep. So somebody has to come up with the money. If you're, if I got a startup and I need $5 million, who do I go to, to get that money? Where Correct. do I raise that money? And that's right. sort of what these guys were doing. Right. Yeah. And liquidity, uh, I mean, it wasn't there. It was, I mean, extremely difficult for a company to get money. And the banks, obviously, you know, the banks, they were almost like non-existent. Yeah, they were going under left and right. They're being bought up. They're Exactly. So, you know, there was an opportunity there. And I saw that opportunity and I went for it. And uh, luckily enough, in I think it was November of 08, like I said, I had taken all my clients' assets and and started. I started playing the ultra shorts like EEV against the um, the emerging markets and um, FXP. Um, I believe it was uh, against the financials, and you know it was like three times inverse. And when they would go down, these things would fly. And I was buying it at like ninety, selling it at like one eighty um, at the end of the day, and then doing it again and again and again. So I built up a lot of uh, you know uh, trust in those months. And then I figured it was a good time for me to kind of segue into something that could potentially perform because nobody, I mean, people were just really holding what they had. There was right. no new money going in the market. So I had access to, to capital at that point. And then when I moved into the private space, um, I, I mean, I enjoyed it. It was, it, was, it was kind of difficult for me because it was hard for me to generate urgency because there's nothing opening or closing or, or trading or moving. Right. So, you know, it was a whole nother animal for me, but I figured out how to make it work. Yeah. So now you have to come up with the proposals, the pitch, you have to yeah, get yeah, them yeah. to give you money and then they have to wait. Right. You have to wait. The companies, they're doing this, they're doing that. They're, they're exactly. leasing a place. They're doing this. Now it's a yeah. long-term strategy that right. you may not be getting money back for years. Like SpaceX. They, right. They were founded in 2002. Yeah. It's just more and more money getting you know, dumped in, dumped in, dumped right. in. But if it does hit, yeah, yeah, then the windfall is massive. Yeah. Um, so did you start? So you started your own company at that point. Yeah. Okay. And you're you get a group of guys. Where did you start it? Uh, right in Fort Lauderdale. Um, we had a couple of different locations because I mean a lot of brokers were. I mean they had left the industry. You know, just like I did. They were looking for other opportunity. That was when like the whole precious metal thing kind of emerged because, you know, gold was, uh, you know, preservation of capital, so to say, or a hedge against inflation. Yeah. And, uh, Everybody's buying know, precious markets. metals. Right. Um, so, so, all right. So you move in there, you hire a bunch of guys. Yep. What happened? Is this where Michelle, is this Michelle Braun or, or is she that came, a little later? She came probably six seven eight months into that whole private world are you still you're still driving the volkswagen no nah, definitely not what are you driving now i mean i had a couple of nice cars <laughs> <laughs> what kind of cars i was a little over the top <laughs> what'd you have i mean yeah i mean i, had I mean i've got the picture i got pictures on the on the <laughs> website like i've seen the cars would you have a lamborghini a ferrari it's, it's weird because those those kinds of things they they kind of they i don't like like now, Even now, Greg. now they're yeah, now they embarrass now you now, but, yeah, but it was, yeah. but it, it, at twenty, at nineteen years old, it yeah. impressed you enough, yeah, that you dropped everything, moved into your car, and hung out for four months to make that happen. Right. But now you look back, but I think I think it's like, and I, I get into this all the time. I don't know. I'm sure you never watch any of my stuff, but I get in this That's all the time. But like you know, it's it, what what was so important. You know, in my twenties and thirties, yeah, right? And, and then you know, then I, and I, I just I do equate it to going to prison. Then I go to prison, and you're living on nothing right. for years, 
and you're okay. You know, I mean, there's, it sucks for the first three months. It's like you're trying, I, I'm trying to think about how to kill myself, but you know, like, how can I do it? So when does the guard come? What will I use? You know, right, right, right. but three, four months, then you start, you know, your expectations of life hit rock bottom. Yep. And then you start enjoying just little yeah, things. You adapt. And yeah. then you also enjoy not having the stresses. Right. So now looking back, seeing how I behave. 50 grand a month in bills is some stupid thing. Like yeah, that. Looking back 20 years, 20 years ago and seeing how I behaved, I'm like, it is. It's embarrassing. I'm like, fuck. Like, right. What were you thinking? Like the things you were doing, the risk you were taking to live or 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 give off a certain appearance. Right. Like optics were everything at that point. It's it's crazy. I mean, but the people it. that watch this want to know. So you're driving a Lamborghini. You're driving a yeah, Ferrari. Like you're a, dating. I had like a. I had a lot. I mean, a lot of right. cars. Like I was a car guy. I got pictures. So. I got pictures on the internet. <laughs> pictures of the house. I got pictures. Yeah. I got a picture of him. Colby, I got a picture of him in front of, I want to say it's either one a Lamborghini or is it two Ferraris or something like that? Or, and you're like, you're, you're in front of your house and you're like this, you're like, like <laughs> and they're both behind him with like the four car garage or something. It's like a, a <laughs> Mediter two story, huge Mediterranean. He, he picked up on the cheap. He's like, Oh, I got that cheap for like two and a half million, like cheap for two and a half. Yeah. Yeah. The guy was going under and I swooped in and I was like, <laughs> And he's sitting there like, yeah, like this with a couple of Lamborghinis behind him. But now he's like, it was, it was doing okay. I was, doing, I, was doing, I was doing all right. I was getting by. So you open the place. So M Michelle Braun. Is there something? It's not the hot ship. It's basically moves in. I mean, I know you had like a year or a few years before Michelle Braun came in. Yeah, yeah. And that whole thing. So what happened yeah. with uh, that? So who, who, who is Michelle Braun? Oh, uh, you can Google her. Matter of fact, <laughs> she had a tattoo on her ass. It said, Google me, bitch. No, it didn't. Yeah. <laughs> and it's probably still there today, unless she got it removed. So he Heidi, Heidi Fleiss, just for anybody who's watching, there was a chick, because Colby didn't know. Yeah. And people that watch this aren't old like me. Um, yeah, well, they are. Old. Some of them are. getting older. So there was a chick named Heidi Fleiss. Yeah, in, she in, was like a lemonade stand compared to Michelle. Bond. Yeah, so yeah. Heidi Fleiss was like the the madam to the stars in Hollywood, right. and when she went under, um, that was just as the internet was kind of like taking root, right? Like people started using the internet, and uh -huh. so Michelle Braun came in as Heidi Fleiss went to prison. Michelle Braun came in and started all these websites mm -hmm. and took over the clientele and and then some of. Uh, Heidi Fleiss's, uh, yeah. you know, the the vacuum that Heidi Fleiss left, and so Michelle Braun was was she took it huge. to the next level. Yeah, yeah she, she definitely took it to the she, next yeah. level. She had like uh, Saudi princes and uh, yeah, yeah. Russian oligarchs, and uh, you know, and she would cater to like their their fantasies, their Hollywood crushes, and all that stuff. And she would yeah, I got all, and, and I got all these. I got pictures yeah. of her on the site with she. She's with uh, mm. is it Charlie Sheen? She's with I have her with um. I a, is it Nicolas Cage? Like she's got all his photos with like all kinds of people. Yeah, Mickey Rourke. Mickey Rourke, when he was, you know, <laughs> when he had a career. Uh, yeah. You know, I'm sure he's a nice guy. Uh, so anyway, um, so what happened? So anyway, uh, so I mean, life was like charmed. I mean, life was. I was living a good life. Right. I was 23, maybe turning 24. Yeah, I was 23, turning 24, because the address of that that ridiculously big house that I bought was 23, 24. <laughs> and okay. I'm like, oh, that's interesting. So I was 23 years old, turning 24. And uh, I would frequent the gentleman club down the block from my office. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'd create different quotas for guys because apparently, you know, these uh, these strip clubs are pretty motivating, you know, <laughs> for, uh, for stockbrokers, right? Right. So... We were at, uh, they had, uh, what was it called? Uh, Solid Gold. And they had a grill in their uh, restaurant called The Palms. The Palms Grill uh, was a place we'd go eat at a lot. You know, they, they had great food there. And uh, we'd be at the, they had like a long dinner table that seated maybe, I don't know, like 15 people, right? So, you know, I'd take all the guys there that, that did well for the day. And we'd just get some food or whatever. And then I'd either, you know, I'd, I'd either go home or whatever. Sometimes, you know, we get a little wild and hang out. So we're, we're eating one night. And this woman walks up to me uh, with long blonde hair, you know, big fake boobs. And, you know, like over-injected lips. No offense. But uh, 
she walks up to me and she says, are you Joe Vitale? And you know, I look at her like, yeah, yeah. Honestly, I thought she was a stripper. At right. First. And she's trying to like, give me a lap dance or something. So I tell her yes. And she says, I'm Michelle Braun. Uh, I'm, I'm John Boyle's girlfriend. And uh, I say, okay, nice to meet you. And uh, then she tries like pitching me some deal. Some uh, John Boyles was idea. he was like a a well known guy. Uh, he right? was he was uh, the son of I believe Jack Boyle. I never met his father, but uh, I guess they opened up or built the restaurant JB's uh, on, the, on the ocean over there. So it's kind of like and, a family uh, name in the area. Yeah, yeah. They they were like I guess they had a big development company, but the guy was always around town driving his Phantom, you know, partying and hanging out and stuff. And, um, so she she tries to pitch me this deal in the middle of you know this club restaurant or whatever and uh you know right away i was like listen you know just yeah come to the office tomorrow or whatever and uh you know if you want some food or some drinks you know just hang out with us so she did that she spent you know a couple of hours just bullshitting and she told me a little bit about herself she never mentioned anything about you know like the whole madam stuff right um but she was well spoken and you know real respectful so when she left i walked her outside to a car you know just to make sure she got out all right and um she she was driving uh john boyle's uh phantom at that time so you know i knew the connection was real was obviously real and uh and and that was that i gave her my card she ended up calling me i think the next day or the day after that and she uh comes by my office and uh and she pitches me what was the pitch uh it was about a company called agro energy and it was a uh uh, it was an alternative energy company, but with, they turned agro, uh, they turned algae into biodiesel fuel. And they had, uh, it was led by a guy named Dr. Jacob Gitman. And he was some scientist out of, uh, out of Russia. And the scientist had been working into this operation over here and trying to get it out there for like the last two, three years. And what he was looking for was $5 million to build a facility in Homestead. And in this facility, I guess they would grow the algae and then they'd have, they'd have the process and the technology to convert that algae into biodiesel fuel. So, I mean, that was pretty much the whole pitch. Um, and she, you know, she was, <laughs> I mean, she went all out on, on courting me and trying to get me involved in that. So, you know, she believed in it. And right. her conviction led me to, to agree to go down to Miami and, and, you know, sit down through this presentation and meet, you know, the scientist. And meanwhile, I mean, I really, at that time, honestly, I really didn't even take any more deals. I was doing several deals and, you know, we didn't have enough bandwidth. Right. But, so you go, down, you go down there. Yeah. So we, we go down there and this is really messed up how this whole thing went down. It was slick. I mean, it I was, was going to say it, <laughs> it, uh, so like from your perspective, I get that you're, you know, that it's like this fucking you know but from looking at it from the outside like it is slick it right. is good when you explained it to me like i got like goosebumps i was like wow <laughs> yeah, wow. she outdid you matt <laughs> yeah that was i was like wow like i didn't see that coming i couldn't believe it man i was like when i thought back on everything i, I wasn't even i i mean i wasn't even ashamed of myself for like being ignorant I oh yeah mean, anybody would have fallen for it yeah, yeah it, like i went through all the right uh, protocols. I mean, to to make sure that everything was okay. I mean, the everything. problem is she was in the mach in the machinery. You know what I'm saying? Like the ghost in the you know yeah. she's in the machinery, debunking yeah everything that you should you know. My life changed after that. Like right. my my entire life, it took a different direction um, after meeting that woman. And it's funny because right now she opened up that that. Uh, that reseller of Hermes Birkin bags in Miami. Yeah. Did, did you read about what happened? Yeah, yeah. It was, it was all, it was all like a Chinese fakes that? or shit, right? Like crazy counterfeits. Yeah, she was selling bags I mean, to like Chris you know, Jenner. Uh, listen, based um, on her, Wayne, based on her crazy. history, you should just know. Anything, I knew it. Listen, anything she's involved in is gonna. I knew be. it the whole time. I mean, when I was, somebody told me they said they don't even have availability like that. Like they don't produce them in right. abundance like that. Like how she was selling them. So. Okay. So you go to you go to Miami to meet with the okay, doctor. Yeah. So so I go to Miami. I'm I walk into this guy's office. Now he's sitting at the end of a conference table, uh, next to this gentleman, uh, Mark Yagala, was his name. 
so Michelle and I walk in, we walk over to them and you know, I extend my hand, I, I introduce myself and he's like, hi, I'm Dr. Jacob Gitman. I shake the other guy's hand, Mark Gala, and, uh, and then we sit down and Dr. Gitman, you know, he has this whole uh, presentation. He, I mean, he gave a really, really good presentation. Just everything was so detailed and articulate and, and I was impressed. So Mark, the guy next to him, he, I mean, he said very little, but when we had left that day, Michelle and I went back to my office and we talked about it and I said, you know, it's pretty cool. So she said, w I mean, they need 5 million. What do you, what would you do it for? So her and I spoke about that, right? We went back and forth and, uh, you know, decided on uh, a figure that we felt, you know, would, could be pushed through, right? Right. She goes back, she allegedly negotiated everything, right? And, uh, and then she comes back to my office the next day and she has things uh, notarized, uh, signed and all that with between her and him, right? And then she says, just, just add your signature on with me, whatever, we'll open up a separate company. Um, we'll raise the money for them and we'll, we'll, we'll open up somewhat of a fund, right? And then we'll send it to them in tranches, in half a million dollar tranches in lieu of stock, right? Right. So, now, mind you, I'm still, I think at this point, maybe I'm 24. Um, so I agree and I sign and I go with her. We open up this business. Um, it was called Sterling Capital Trust. And uh, the uh, the day we opened it, I you know I had a conversation with her on on how things would be run. And you know we each had our, our roles because she wanted to be actively involved and and to take on that extra deal, I needed it. So she was going to handle uh, some things on the admin end, and and she did that. She did it well for the time, you know, that we did it together. All right. Um, but I asked her, could Dr. Gitman come into the office and give that same presentation to my guys? And she said, yeah, sure. You know, I'll call and you know we'll see if he can come in. Um, so he was supposed to show up to the office. I think two days after that. Um, he didn't come though. The the gentleman that was sitting next to him, Mark, right, right his CFO, uh, would come. And Mark came. He gave a, a decent presentation, right? But it wasn't the same. And uh, you know, I went with it, and you know, my brokers were somewhat excited. And it was another deal, right? Something else to bring to their clients. And uh, you know, we negotiated a nice equity stake in the company. And when he left. I was convinced that he was, you know, who he said he was. Yeah, yeah. This right. is a real deal. This is the the CFO showed yeah. up. He pitched it. I mean, I brought good. everything to uh, to my attorney on Dr. Gitman. He was a real scientist. I mean, he had some, you know, accolades or whatever, and uh, and he had never been, you know, he, he didn't have a checkered past or anything. So I start raising capital. You know, we're putting some of our guys into the deal, and when we hit just over four hundred thousand. And this isn't a matter of like, I don't know, you know, like two weeks. Um, you know, we just kept, we were slowly piecing into it. At that point, Michelle's role was to make sure that the capital, right, got transferred over to Agro Energy in lieu of the stock search. Right. And she had to make sure that the investors received their stock search. Right. So, so the process is your guys, your your guys are calling investors saying hey we got a new company here's what we need put in a hundred thousand two hundred thousand so guys are given twenty thousand fifty thousand right. five thousand a hundred thousand yeah. you guys you and then they're going to get stock in the company in exchange for that right, and right. of course hopefully this the company ends up becoming huge and your stock becomes worth a, way more than what you invest right right and we didn't want any one guy to have any too large of a position because you know it's an early stage venture and obviously you know there's a lot of risk associated with it so yeah, we were kind of just building like little portfolios right. in these startups. So two weeks later, you got to go out four hundred thousand dollars, and she the money goes into the bank account, and she's right. supposed to. Well, the problem send was the, send I, the money changed, to him. I changed the plan. It was supposed to be every half a million, right? We sent over. So I told her because it was dragging out a little longer than expected. So some of the guys that initially got in, uh, you know, it was like. Like I said, about two weeks in, you know, they, they were like, you know, where's my stock shirt, right? Right. So I told her, listen, every quarter million at this pace, because I had so many other deals going on. Right. Every quarter million, just, you know, exchange it. And uh, 
So she was supposed to do that. So some of my first guys in, they kept at, you know, badgering me. They're like, listen, what's going on? Like, where, you know, where's my stock? So I would go to Michelle and I, you know, pressure her to get it done. So one day I go into the office and Michelle doesn't show up. Um, I call her, she doesn't answer. And I'm thinking maybe she's sick. Maybe she uh, has something going on. So then this happened the second day. And then again, the third day, and by the third day, I'm like, there's something wrong here. Right. So I drive to her house in Boca and, um, and she's not there. Right. And I, I leave like, I'm trying to like look in the windows. I'm calling her, her phone's off. And, um, you know, it was then I said to myself, something's definitely wrong. So I get in my car and I drive to the bank and, you know, I was ignorant for not looking sooner, I think. But again, I mean, everyone had their role. And, uh, and I was, I mean, just overwhelmed by the amount of, you know, work that I took on in the first place. So right. I see the account and she had spent like, I don't know, 350 grand out of that. 400,000. Yeah, yeah. On like stupid shit, like, like at nightclubs, uh, you know, at like uh, Saks Fifth Avenue. Um, Wasn't there one for like the dog, doggy puppy dick? Palace, puppy Palace, yeah. Like, so it gotta, was just petty shit. Like I never, honestly, I never expected anyone to try to do something like that because I know it's possible. I know how much, you know. Well, plus you'd been to this guy's, his lab, you've met the doctor, like everything yeah. seems, everything's legit. Yeah. Like why would you She's do dating this successful guy in town. She's driving his right. car. You know where she lives. Yeah. And she had a beautiful house of her own. I mean. All right. She's yeah. clearly successful. So, right. So I'm thinking, why would she, you know, why would she use this as a piggy bank? It never right. even crossed my mind until I saw that. And uh, I mean, she had like, she spent like 15 grand at like live nightclub. I mean, <laughs> it was just ridiculous stuff. So. I pick up the phone, I call my point of contact in the company, which was Mark Egala, right? The right. CFO. I say, Mark, uh, Michelle, she spent the money. He's like, what do you mean? I'm like, Michelle, she spent the money that we were raising for Agro Energy. And he said, she told me that you guys hadn't started the raise yet. So, I mean, I just turned white at this point. <laughs> like I knew at that point, I'm like, this is all fucked up. Right. You know, hey, this is, I didn't know who was who at that point, but I just wanted to fix it. So I said, Mark, listen to me. I don't know what the situation is, what, who told who what, but the fact is I have clients and I think there was like, I don't know, not that many of them, but there was probably in that like 400 and change, it was probably about 18, 25, 20 clients. I don't know. like just five, 10 grand, whatever. And uh, I said, we have to have a solution for this because this is absolutely gonna go criminal, right. right? I mean, forget about regulatory. I mean, this is a criminal situation here and, and, and our name's all over it. So we need to either get these guys stock or give them money back. Right. And uh, so I asked him, I mean, you have stock in the company? He said, yeah, yeah, I have shares. I have a position in the company. I said, okay, do you have $400,000 of stock? He said, yes, I do. And he said, what do you want me to do? Give my stock to them? I said, well, give it to them now and we'll figure this out later, right? I'll help you out with it, whatever. You know, just let's just put this thing to bed. So he, so he agrees. Then he says, uh, she spent all the money? I said, no, there's like, I don't know. I think there was 80,000 left actually. So I said, no, there's, there's 80 grand in the account. That's it. And we raised on like 400 and something thousand. So... He said, if I'm giving 400 grand of stock, at least send me to 80,000 then. Right. So, uh, yeah, so I agree, you know, and uh, it was, looking back, it's so stupid the way I was doing things. I was doing things on the fly. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's just like thinking that people saw the world the way I saw it. And uh, so I send him the 80,000. I pick up the phone to confirm he got it. And now Mark is ghost, right? <laughs> He's gone. He won't answer the phone. So... <laughs> Oh my God. I remember the feeling still. It was like, I felt like I was in a prison cell right then and there actually. <laughs> um, so now I'm like, wow, I'm on my own with this shit. Right. So then- Are you realizing he's a part of the whole thing now? Or are you just- Yeah. You, and now okay. I'm thinking the whole, all of them are bullshit. So now I call up, uh, so, and when I, when I spoke to Mark originally, what he had told me, 
He's like, no, no, don't say anything to Doctor Gitman. Right. He's like, he'll 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 probably contact the authorities. He didn't. He thought that you didn't start either, and and he's gonna freak out because you're gonna give the company a bad name and get it wrapped up in all this BS. Right. So I said, okay, if you can solve the issue, then it stays between us. I just want these guys to either have their money back or what they paid for. So, so he, uh, so when he vanishes, now I have to call Gitman. Right. Right. Um, at that time, I didn't have four hundred thousand cash, right? I probably had like two hundred, close to three hundred thousand cash, which I was ready to pay to give to the investors. Right. Uh, Doctor Gitman answers the phone, and I say, "Hey, Doctor Gitman, it's Joe Vitale. How you doing?" He said, "Joe who?" I said, "Joe Vitale," and he said, "I'm okay. Uh, what's this call in regards to?" I said, "Our business that we have together, right?" the raise that I was doing for you. He said, he, he said, no one's raising money for my company. I'm like, Doc, do you remember me? He said, not really. Uh, and I said, I'm the guy that walked in your office with that tall blonde woman right. a couple of weeks ago. He said, oh yes, yes, yes. So now I'm like, thank God. You know what I mean? Okay. Thank God. Right. We're, we're this getting, part, this part so we got, yeah, this part, at least this is legit. He's a real doctor. This right. is a real company. Okay. Yeah. At least that's legit so far. Yep. So, so he says, um, so he says, yeah, I remember you. I do. I do. I do. Right. With the blonde woman, you guys came in. Yeah. She's like, so how have you been? I'm like, uh, <laughs> not good. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, well, I raised 300 or $430,000 for your company that's gone. So I tell him everything and he's like, you got to be kidding me. He's like, listen. He's like, kid, you have nothing to do with me. He's like, you're on your own. Right? He's like, I never signed anything. I said, I have your name notarized on a contract with Michelle Braun, the blonde woman. Mm -hmm. And he said, I never saw her after that day. How the hell could I have it notarized with her? I was never in the same room with her. So then, obviously, instantly, I realized. CFO? Right. So- I said, I just sent money to your CFO. He said, I don't have a CFO. I said, wait, what? So he said that he doesn't have a CFO and he's right now currently the president and an interim CEO and CFO, right? He's you know wearing many hats. So I said, I met your CFO in that meeting. He was sitting next to you when I walked in the room. You know what he tells me? He said, he was with you. He just got to the meeting early and sat next to me, kid. So dude, when he walked in, he's sitting at the table. <laughs> right? That's Is crazy. that like... So, oh my uh, God. so I realized I was on my own with it. So I go back home. <laughs> and I think I had like a couple shots of uh, a blue. And then I sat there and I was like, I, I got to give the money back, right? Yeah. So I started going one by one and I'm writing checks to these guys and I went through and I think I paid like 220 grand back and I had some more money and then I was just like just getting liquid on different things that I had out there to cover the whole nut, right? And and I did and I had it. I had, I had the amount, right? So when I hit like just under a quarter million and the whole payback process, I realized I didn't have every investor because I it was like I paid everyone back and it's only like it was like 220 grand. Right. So I'm like, holy shit. The process that we had was so faulted because Michelle Braun, she would get the get the data on the uh on the investor, some of which were new that we that we, you know, freshly onboarded. And the lead would get shredded, so you know there would never be a dupe file or somebody calling internally an existing uh, you know client. And uh, so she would do that, and then she would put them. She would obviously have that all that info in her computer, and then Which she you don't would, have right. She was gone with her laptop, and uh, and that's what she worked off of. Which is another lesson I learned that you know people can never work on their own computers or devices when they come to the office. So now you know. It's it's uh it's like a uh I mean I'll never break that rule like I will always you have to work on the company devices <laughs> so so she uh she had the last like two hundred and ten thousand dollars of clients in her computer that I I didn't even know 
I went, by the time I went to the bank, they had subpoenaed, uh, they had gotten wind or whatever. They, they shut the account down okay? yeah. because complaints started coming in. And uh, it was just a mess. I couldn't, I, I started calling her, leaving a voicemail. I said, Michelle, I'm not trying to trap you here. I, I'm going to pay back the investors. I need your laptop. Give me your laptop. I'll, I'll take care of it. You know, your name's yeah. all over this. You should be concerned. And I never got a call back. So that was that. I went to my attorney and I told him what happened. And he said to me, I got the worst legal advice ever. He said to me, you don't want to go to the authorities because if you do, then you're likely to incriminate yourself. He said, how do they know that you weren't in on it or that you weren't there at Live Night Club or there at Puppy Palace? And uh, I'm like, I definitely wasn't there at Planned Parenthood. Right? <laughs> it was a charge from Planned Parenthood. <laughs> One of the girls. Yeah. Um, oh my God. So, well, which was, was horrible uh, because literally if you had gone into the the feds or even the state, you could have gone in and they would have done like a pre-trial intervention where they would have yeah. said, look, you just make it good. Right. And we won't charge you. Like right. that happened. I could have gotten the data from them and paid it. Right. Yeah. Right. Like anybody that shows up or, or just look, anybody that... You know, they, yeah, of course, they have the subpoena from the records. They would have subpoenaed exactly. the um, the bank. The, where did these wires come from? Let's yep. track them back. Let's get these people paid. But it didn't work out. Instead, your lawyer, listen, I, the amount of the amount of bad information and advice that lawyers give is ridiculous. You know why he gave that to me? Because he, he gave me a price. I think it was if like it does go grand. criminal. No, right away. I paid like 50 grand just to talk to the guy. He was a pretty high profile guy like around town. Everybody said right. great things about him. Um, so I give him like $50,000 and he said that was going to be it. And then maybe like another 20 or something if we had, I ended up going to trial, right, eventually. But he kept doing continuance after, because eventually that, you know, they came for me. So I sat there like a duck following his orders. They come for me and, uh, you know, the U.S. Marshal, they, they <laughs> whatever, forget that whole thing. The, the point is, uh, I took his advice and, you know, the whole process of continuances and continuance after continuance, it put the guy in a position, the attorney in a position to say, you know, we need more money. So I'm like, you know, you told me $50,000. Right. And then maybe another 20 if we went to trial. So throughout that course, they're like getting 50,000, 50,000, 50,000, 50,000, all the way through these continuances. I'm like, you're not even doing anything. You're filing, you know, you're filing like a piece of paper. Right. So every time he'd look at me and say, let me ask you a question. He said, what's your freedom worth, Joe? <laughs> Dick. So I'm like, I just got scammed. Yeah, and you're, now yeah. you're scamming me. Yeah. So I don't know. Yeah, I paid $75,000 for an attorney to plead me guilty. <laughs> to take a plea. Yeah, that's what they do. But no, I mean, we need them and there's some good ones. And uh, Frank Maester is an amazing attorney. No, <laughs> he is. That's my guy. So, um, so you end up getting charged with uh, um, uh, with running a boy for conspiracy to run a boiler room. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And but you pay you pay the money back. Yeah. So uh, half of it was already like paid back, obviously. So so we, I got charged with the same thing that Michelle Braun got charged with. I oh, fucking amazing, amazing. She's idiot. So we had to pay like one hundred and ten thousand to, to balance, right? Because that's all they got affidavits for. Because the rest were paid, um, so the one hundred and ten thousand dollars each up front to stay out of jail, right? And um, then they give me a year of house arrest uh, with uh, five years probation. So here's the part, and I remember when we were writing the story. I remember telling, saying this to you is that here's the part that kills me. She only got four hundred and some odd thousand. If she had just issued the fake certificates, if she'd issued fake certificates. She could have got half, two million, uh, yeah. five million. Yeah, I never. Who knows? I never would have known. Right. He never. If, if the investors had gotten these fake certificates, they would have kept. He would have kept raising money. She would have kept issuing the, um, the certificates, till she got the five million. And then she could have. She could have disappeared with the five million. And then, of course, he would have figured out one day somebody would have wanted to go by the company or go take a tour or talk to the doctor or something right. at some point it would have it would have all fallen apart 
But she could have got five million. Instead, she, you know, like an idiot, just immediately just started like woohoo and started running running around Puppy Palace and buying, you know, collars for her dog or whatever. Like just ridiculous. So yeah. So so you were on probation. Yeah, I did uh I did the one year home confinement. It was miserable. And then uh five years four years? Four years probation. And uh yeah. What did the one guy get? What was the one guy that actually went oh to jail? Oh my god, man. So that you, was so sad. That it, was like a really sad moment because you know, he was like he was basically a partner. Like he was he was working his way into uh a partnership with me. And you know, he was a great guy. And uh he for some weird reason, right? Because you know they, we had to turn ourselves in, right? Uh, and then bond out, and um, and you know I had a private attorney, right, right. defending me. He had a public defender, and uh, he took an open plea with the judge, and for that, for what Michelle did, right? And they gave him fifteen years in prison for that. And he didn't do a goddamn thing. Right. He just he's just one of the guys raising the money. Yeah. Right. So he's one but think about it. All that's happening is I work for somebody, I cold call, I raise money, and they come in, they say, Hey, they give a presentation. Hey, there's this agro, you know, agro what was it called? Energy. Agro energy, here's what we do, blah, blah, blah. They give him some some glossy brochures. They show him a website. They say we're raising money. Here's how much you get. He's like, mm-hmm. Okay, okay. Just like any other company that came in. A light company, a doorbell company, a company that makes wristwatches, whatever they're raising money for. They come in, they give a pitch, they go, oh, okay. They start making cold calls, they raise the money. And then a few weeks later, he finds out he's being indicted. Like, I, like, what do you mean there's an arrest warrant? What do you mean? What did I do? Gets a, doesn't have the money to get a pu- private attorney, gets a public defender. Public defender says, he's saying, I didn't do anything wrong. All I did was what I was told to do. With I, they came in. It's just like anything. I didn't do. It. I didn't know that these people were spending the money. And the the public defender says, "Well, you can go in front of the judge and do what's called an open plea." Right, where you're you can, at the mercy of the judge. You can explain to the judge what happened. I didn't know anything. I didn't do anything. Here's what happened, and the judge may take pity on you. Instead, they give him 15 years. Yeah, I heard he like fell to his knees and he, he was just. Went he went in front of the judge and said, "Your Honor, this is what happened." He explains, "I work for this this company. They came in. We call. We do cold calls. We raise money. I didn't know it was a scam." Judge gave him fifteen years. And everybody else got probation, house arrest, yeah. and probation because they because they had p- private attorneys that made a, a made or even if they had a public defender, they they took a plea bargain. They took a plea, right. they admitted I, guilt and yeah, yeah. took probation or. Admitted guilt Joe. and paid a fine. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so everybody yeah. else had private attorneys. But they, they made their agreement up front. Took a plea. He yeah. felt like yeah. I can explain this. I can explain this to the judge. He'll understand. He didn't. You can't years. really claim ignorance in anything. Any any sort of criminal activity. That's they, not they don't no. want to hear it. No. You can't say I didn't know. Right. Ignorance <laughs> Even is if you didn't. no excuse for the law. Yeah. Right. I think that's the term. And uh, yeah, fifteen years. I mean, you know, here's I the still th- speak to him. He's out now. Oh yeah, yeah. did he, he didn't do fifteen years, right? He got it. A- no, no, no. He did. I think seven. Seven years. Something like that. Seven years. Yeah. Well, listen, I'd be bitter. I'd be a bitter, bitter, pissed off person. Like uh, that would that would that would ruin my good nature. Oh man, because I have a good nature. I'm a nice person. I feel. You know, I'm I'm a pretty pretty go, happy go lucky bitter? guy. I'm not bitter at all, but yeah, I'm also very guilty. It. Yeah, you did. I did it. <laughs> like if I had gone to if I went to prison because I wasn't guilty, I come out You'd burn uh, that place down. Oh man, I'd be pissed. Oh, I'd be. Oh. I can't imagine that. Like that that seven years for something you didn't do. You really didn't really didn't have any part in. You know, I interviewed a guy the other day. Did 16 years for a rape and a murder at 16 years old. Didn't do it. And while he got released, sixteen years later, what he did sixteen years, and then after sixteen, how did they figure years, it out? What like an old uh, no, or the um, uh, what is it? The Innocence Project came in and found out, uh, retested the DNA, 
and uh, found out that who the DNA went to was a 29 year old guy. And since when this guy was in in prison for the rape and murder, he didn't commit. The guy that did commit it killed a school teacher. Cops totally frightened. Why did him. they put him in prison at because that time? They didn't have the technology. They had to, DNA, but they didn't have the CODIS, the, the data bank where you could test it. So they tested it against him. They knew it wasn't his DNA. They said, oh, she's promiscuous. It's some other high school oh, student. Man. Well, then 15 year, or 16 years later, he gets the Innocence Project to test it again against CO it, to put it into CODIS. Right. Let's see if we can find the guy, the real guy. Yeah. They find the real guy. They release him. He gets out. He sues. He yeah, but the, they, they didn't make a case to say, oh, that was just the guy that was with him before him. No, no, because they they had they had pinpointed a, an actual student. They had said, "Oh, it's this student." Keep in mind, he had a public defender who did nothing, who's basically like, "Oh, take a plea, take a plea." Like he he did nothing yeah. during the trial. I mean, it's complete. And and the cops, listen, it, it's you got to watch the video. You'd have to watch the whole interview. It's it's fucking horrific. But still, same thing. It's like it's like, yeah. what's going on? Like it's horrible. The the more of these I do, like I'm actually a big proponent of 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 law and order. Like I, I'm I'm I'm. Like I don't have yeah, a problem, it. right? Yeah. You need it, right? So you, you know, I, I'm I'm not like a, I don't have a bad taste in my what, mouth. What from I don't the like is how how the authorities or investigators or whatever you want to call it, right? I feel like their performance is somewhat competitive in a way. I, I mean, maybe right. I'm wrong, but I feel like it's just another notch in their belt. Right. Or like, or it's like about getting a, it's, it's about indictments. Yeah. Like, it's about, get, oh, let's get the indictment. Let's get the arrest. Let's they get should the be charge. rewarded on accuracy. Right. But like, they're not really concerned about justice. And that's what I'm, right. as I do more and more of these, I'm like, are you serious? Like you hear that you hear it and you're like, that's like, there's no way the cops didn't know. And sometimes the cops are even just completely faking yeah. the information. Like, like, like they're, they're, they're creating information they're lying they're blatantly right. yeah, lying i mean it's, i feel like they're, they're fearful of wasting the government's resources that's like the greatest yeah. fear if they conduct an 18-month investigation right. and come up at the end they're like oh this guy's innocent yeah. he didn't do anything and if a 16 year old kid like, has to get a life sentence well then that's fine i, I need the promotion yeah. he has to do life that's that's his problem like uh, and that that's literally that was that like was how like they were you. huh that was like uh almost like we seen you right yeah well, yeah, but at least Rossini was doing anything, doing something. He was actually Rossini was actually making methamphetamine. Like he was actually a drug dealer. At least you were you were in right. the you were in the position yeah. to be to be framed. Right. But this is just a high school kid who happens to live a mile away from where they found the body. Oh, that that was this guy. That, 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 did, that, that was the scenario. Yeah, yeah, and he oh and he was God. a student. They were also he was a he was a student in the school. They were in some of the same classes. Somebody a brought up sixteen year old. Somebody brought That's up his name. Nightmare. He went in for an interview. They said, hey, let's do a polygraph. He does the polygraph. They tell him he failed. They question him for seven hours straight. Tell him these the the cops are going these other cops are gonna hurt you. I'm trying to help you. Just go ahead, tell him a story. Just just admit that what you admit you did this and I can get you. You won't be arrested. I gotta get you out of here. You just gotta tell him something. So he says, okay, okay, I, I did it, I did you it. You see the stuff where they, like, where they wear you down, they keep you in the room for like Seven hours, day, you're 16 years old? Two days, and you get so tired, you just want to, like, oh, you can have a nice warm bed, buddy. Don't worry, here's a pillow. Yeah. You know, we'll, we'll give you a bed, just admit it. <laughs> they're so tired. Yeah. You see these things yeah. that they're like, all right, fine, I did yeah. it, let me go sleep. Well, and, and he's 16 years old. You're 16 years old, you've never had a grown adult, especially a police officer, yell at you, pound the desk, get in your face, threaten you. They're scaring him, he's terrified. And he eventually just says, okay, okay, I did it, can I go home now? You're under arrest. But anyway, so, so eventually. Well, I have a question about, that yes. scam? Yeah, sorry, sorry, oh no, well, that that's not the scam. Well, I know, how, how did they target you? How did they know, like... What? Michelle Braun? Yeah. Just, oh, she okay, she just needed a stockbroker. She needed somebody yeah, so raising capital. At that time, there was, like, only a few guys there, in town that were... Uh, at the time, there was only a few guys in town that were, I guess, successful at, like, raising money for, you know, to say the 5 to $10 million range startup companies. Um there was really only just a few of us that were kind of out there about it and, and doing it in that way. Um, John Boyle, you know, he knew me and he just, he dropped my name and uh, told her, you know, where my office was and where, you know, where, uh, where my crew hangs out and everything. And then, uh, and then, so she pulled up on me, you know, but uh, I definitely wasn't quiet. I mean, I was pretty loud around town. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's a good question. I fear I, I should have. Yeah, but I I already but I already knew that because I knew 
that, right because yeah. you had told me before so yeah yeah um okay so what's up with the what happened with the bouncy house you remember the bouncy house the bouncy house you know, I seen that. Vi- Did I send you the video? Okay, There's I, a video. Of you it. probably thought I was making that up for a second. Didn't you? No, no, I was trying. <laughs> no, no, I was trying to pinpoint the actual, like, the date. Memorial Day. Yeah, and and I remember when I read the story, I was like, I wonder if there's a video. And there is. There's a video of the bouncy house. The whole was thing. It, do I remember correctly? There was five or six kids in it. There was a bunch of kids. Some of them broken arms. Yeah, broken they legs. fell out. And, yeah. Tornado was, picked up a bouncy house at the beach. All right. He's still on Day. probation, by the way. So he's still. I'm sorry. This is when. Yeah. Yep. You, you were at the beach. You were at the beach yep, yep. and on probation, beach. not yeah, interested in raising money. Things behind me. I'm like, I'm never messing with any. I don't ever want to touch OPM. Right. I don't want to go near, you know, I'm like, uh, I don't want to go near stocks. I don't want to go near anything. I just want to enjoy my life. Right. You know, and go work at Walmart or something like yeah. that. Yeah. Something. And you're, you're, you're at the beach <laughs> yeah. one uh, day. Yeah, I'm there with uh, with my girlfriend, and we're hanging out on the sand, relaxing. It was Memorial Day, and she uh, she has a son. He was I don't know three years old, and uh, they had a bunch of these bouncy houses on the beach for Memorial Day, whatever the city you know provided them. And uh, we, I see something coming in from the ocean, like it was like a cloud, and it looked like it was falling into the ocean, right? So I'm like, wow, look at that over there, and uh, it was a tornado. So a tornado comes onto land and it swoops up one of the bouncy houses with kids in it. It takes it like 90 feet in the air. Are you watching it right now? No, I'm listening. Uh, no, <laughs> we should play it, bro. <laughs> like it, like you, they show, like the people are screaming. Like there's a bouncy house. It picks, throws it over, the, over the, then it throw it over like the street or something. Yeah, it landed, I think in the road or, or something like that. And uh, her son was just in that bouncy house. So, Anyway, the uh, so that happens. So now I was like, uh, I don't want to go in the water. Uh, so then I put my shoes on and I'm like, let's just go to the restaurant, you know, get something to eat. I want to get the hell away from that ocean. It's like popping out white squalls and shit. Um, so we do that. We leave the beach and we start walking up uh, A1A. And uh, when we get to a restaurant, I think it was Cafe Del Mar, right there on Fort Lauderdale Beach, uh, I hear my name called. So, you know, I look around and I see an old friend of mine, uh, this guy Royce Teets, and uh, he was sitting there with uh, with two ladies. One was his girlfriend. One was his girlfriend's friend. Nice people. Uh, you know, they're you know young professionals, and uh, I've known him for. I don't know, five, six years prior to that, we met. But mind you, I mean, I just got out of that whole thing, like house arrest. So I haven't seen a lot of people. You know, I was kind of, you know, off the grid for a little while. So I say, what's up? How you doing? I was in great shape at the time. Like, because that's what you do when, uh, yeah. when you have, you know, money problems. You work out every day, all day. And then you start making a little money and then you get fat and start eating lobster all day. Right? I know. <laughs> I'm going to lose 15 pounds minimum. <laughs> Go ahead. So, uh, so I see you voice and you know, we start talking, how you been, how you doing? Um, he tells me about a project that he's working on. And obviously it, it was, I mean, it had to do with the whole- Raising know, capital. Right, private equity, uh, startup stuff. And uh, so we talk for uh, a half hour, 45 minutes. Come down by the office, Joe, come check it out, man. And I'm like, listen, Royce, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to be part of anything like that right now. I just, I don't trust anyone. I mean, I lost faith in everything. You know, I, I felt like I went through all the, uh, you know, the proper channels and proper protocol to f- know if something's bullshit or uh, or real and, and I failed, right? So I'm, I don't have confidence in myself at that point to work in that space. So... I'm like, all right, you know, whatever. Give me your number and, you know, we'll, we'll go get lunch one day. So we do that. We get lunch at the Cheesecake Factory on Las Solas. And uh, he then takes me over to his office. And I swear, if uh, it was like a drug. Like I walked in the office with him and I see guys like writing deals I see people on the phone laughing with their clients, having like, you know, great conversations. Um, 
And I just felt like I had just bumped into like the one that got away, you know? And uh, I just, like everything just went out the window. I swear, like all my like uh, strength to abstain getting involved in that industry. Cause I felt like, you know, the industry had just put me through that and chewed me up. Right. Um, it went out the window and I, we started instantly. We were like negotiating, <laughs> we were like sitting in his office. Okay. So, so how does the deal work? You know, um, what's the valuation, uh, you know, who put that valuation on it? Um, you know, what's, what's your role? What's your cut? Da, 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 da. And then by the time I went home, I had my whole plan, right? I had everything planned out, mapped out in my head. And uh, so I showed up the next day and uh, and that's and then we started working together from that point forward. Okay, so you had your plan. What was the plan? The plan that I made with, with Royce or the plan that I made with myself? <laughs> what were both plans? What okay. were the plans? Royce's plan was to have me get back into the industry and work for him. Right. Right. He's like, I just got a power broker involved. So, you know, he figured I would go in there. He'd sit me down and, you know, wherever I fit in. And uh, and I'd basically, you know, make a living and put a bunch of money in his pocket. Um, my plan was to basically, you know, get my beak wet again, uh, you know, shake off the rust. And then show out and then renegotiate and say, you know, what am I doing here? Because, uh, I mean, you know, I know what I'm capable of. And uh, I didn't want to, uh, I definitely, I hadn't worked for anyone since I was 23, 22. So I wasn't ready to go sit in a cubicle and, you know what I mean? Right. So it was just, a, it was like a kind of a, you know, a foundation that I needed to get back in. Okay. So what happens? <clears throat> so, so I start working in there and he had been involved in a, it was really, a, it was, it was a medical deal and uh, not to get too into that. The details are important, but bottom line is I got in and I, I worked alongside, you know, all the uh, employees and about two weeks in, I opened up a ton of accounts, right? I attracted a bunch of new uh, accounts. And then I, uh, I was there one day when Royce brings in a friend of his with two other people. And I believe it, their names were Lex, Anthony, and David. And these guys had a couple of different projects they were working on. They were pretty cool projects. Uh, one was like a, you know, the, like a wind uh, turbine, right? Which I never... I mean, I saw like a million of those deals. So I was like, whatever, you know, I'm not interested in that. Um, not that it was my say at the time, right? You right. Know, these were deals that were brought to Royce. But one of them was a deal that involved the lottery, okay? And the the idea was to create a mobile app or a web app, as they call it, you know, both a web presence, but obviously, you know, a corresponding mobile application, iOS and Android. And... Uh, and it would be a lottery concierge service where if you wanted to play the lottery, you wouldn't have to walk into a store and wait in line and buy a ticket. And especially if you lived in one of the 16 or so states that don't have lottery, you wouldn't have to drive over state lines to buy a ticket uh, or not buy a ticket. You would always have access. <clears throat> so we would facilitate the purchase or, you know, lotto net was called, would facilitate the order and actually conduct the transaction, safeguard the ticket. And then uh, uh, make a marketing opportunity out of uh, any uh, winnings. If someone won, they would create you know a spectacle out of it and deliver the winnings and uh, and you know promote lot on it. So it right. would collect like a fifty cent concierge fee uh, if a user bought up to five tickets in any one particular uh, lottery. That deal was presented that day, and you know the the founder of that, uh, David. Gray, they were gray. Right. right. He he basically said, he basically said, he showed me a demo and he looked around like, how do you guys do this? Like what? Like you you literally can generate a following and, and generate awareness and, and investment interest over the phone? I said, yeah. I mean, that's how a lot of the business is done. And um, 
he's like he was almost he almost didn't buy in i think i uh, so i said watch this <laughs> so i picked up the phone and i called one of the guys that i had opened like a week or two prior and um i think it was like 50 grand or something so i, I got him committed the first investment for that idea and uh startup and he was just like holy shit you know i mean this is possible um and incredibly talented guy that's what i was interested in so when that came around this is like two weeks into working with voice when that deal came into the office along with david i didn't pay much attention to the other guys um i started getting in voices here i said listen you have to do this deal and i want to do it with you right you know i'm not going to sit here in a cubicle for long you know that i'm either going to go my own way and get my own deal or you and I do this together. And you know what I'm capable of, right? You know, whatever deal I take on, you know, I complete it, I finish it, and, you know, do it pretty efficiently. So he was a little uh, opposed to it. You know, he didn't want to lose control and, you know, he, he wanted to keep me keep me down uh, like, like usual in that industry. Um, but he accepted and we agreed, made an agreement to go 50-50. And, uh, and that meant both in, uh, you know, uh, as far as working towards the deal and accomplishing the deal, recruiting, training, uh, managing, and obviously, you know, raising capital because we knew we had to grow to take down, you know, the several rounds that, you know, were, uh, were planned for the company. So what was the first, first round? Uh, the A round was 5 million and then the B round was going to be another five. And then we knew that, you know, obviously the C would probably be like 25 at least uh, or more uh, once, you know, the company had some traction. Uh, but right now you're just on the 5 million. So, yeah. okay. So, you know what we ought to do? We ought to play the, he, there's a tape or they, um, there's a little video that they use to pitch investors, right? Like it's a little lottery net. <laughs> we should put that at the end of the or we could either put the link put the in link in, yeah. yeah put the link in and it, it's a, it's a cute little demo of you know them yeah. it, you know explaining like you know the, about the tickets and everything but it's like a little um it's an animation it's, yeah, anim it's, it's like an animated uh uh pitch deck kind of yeah but it doesn't talk about like really, it talks a little bit about financials but not about the actual investment opportunity the breakdown and anything like that but, but it's super but it, it's it's good it's like a treat you, right yeah yeah it is it's good dave did an incredible job on that and he did it so fast you know when i met david because <clears throat> i was never like a high tech guy and when he when he watched us work he said to me uh something along the lines of i, I he's like i can't believe how effective you are i mean when you're working like a caveman right and i was like who the hell is this guy? Picking up the phones. Uh, yeah, uh, you know, writing notes like on paper. Right. Like, I just, I, I never adopted the whole like CRM idea. And uh, at that time. I, I, right. Yeah. yeah. And this is like probably 2015 or something, which I was kind of late to the game. And now, now you know, I'm like the opposite. Right. Right. But, uh, you know, I had my little index card box with my index cards in it and like with a uh, Sharpie and a pipeline. And these were like, you know, interested party. So, um, so it was pretty generous, and uh, and I was excited about the fact that David offered to help build a CRM, okay, which is you know a, a customer relationship management software, and uh, and it's basically something that would help us with our workflow and the entire sales process to work more effectively and produce more, so we can knock down the raises quicker. Right. So obviously, I'm like, yeah, that'd be awesome. So he started off uh, with uh, a process where at the end of every lead, you know, he created a, a button where we would just have to fill in the email and then convert it to a prospect. Um, and at that point, an investor kit would be sent out automatically. Okay. And then we started uh, adding in features like read receipts. So then we would get notified when a prospect was actually, you know, engaging uh, with the documents, which was which was huge and different for me at that time. Now it's, you know, it's like typically in every CRM, but I was so intrigued by it and, and started using it. I mean, like really adopting it and, uh, and I was fully bought in. So Royce and myself, we, we went and got another location 
at that point, we start knocking down the rays, you know, getting guys involved. Royce had an old book of clients, obviously, because, you know, he, he, he never had had any time away from right. the industry. So he had his, you know, his preferred clients. And um, and we just went at it, you know. Um, we raised uh, a fair amount of money in the first month. We went down and got a big office with uh, like a warehouse in the back. And, you know, we had this whole idea that we would make the office a place that nobody would ever want to leave. Right. You know? Strip of all. Let's leave that out. <laughs> it wasn't my idea. <laughs> it was told nobody was more upset about the stripper pole than me. It was, it was degrading. It was, it was wrong. It was degrading to women. It was wrong. I just wanted a comfortable, safe, safe place for people. Right. A safe space. Right. I did make it a requirement though that the pole was removable. Okay. So it wasn't like a standard fixture in the office. It was like Yeah. But there was a hydraulic system. You pushed a button and it came up through the <laughs> through the through the floor. <laughs> no. Bring them on. <clears throat> there was a vote on it, man. I, I, you lost. I did. Okay, uh, I believe you. So, um, all right. So, the office is cool. Yeah. So, so we got two spaces right next to each other uh, in this building, and the warehouse in the back. You know, we blew the wall out and made a conjoining door. And uh, on one side, we had the tech team. On the other side, we had, you know, the sales and, uh, you know, the, uh, the finance end, right? Royce and I were 50-50 on the finance end. And, uh, you know, and David ran the whole tech side. And he, he ran it, I mean, incredibly well. It was a tight ship. You know, we had like 40 or 50 guys there just plugging away. Quality assurance, uh, as you know, as opposed to the the sales team side, which is they're having uh, they're having <laughs> Friday their Friday night meeting. They bring in midgets and throw them through uh, <laughs> throw them through goals and yeah. <laughs> no. yeah. I see. I hear. It, it was a little stripper wild. Tuesdays in that warehouse. We built a bar. You know, we had pool tables. We put barber chairs in there. Um, I never wanted guys to leave and go get a haircut on Friday. I'm like, just stay here. We'll cut your hair. Right? We had barbers come in. You know, across the street there was a guy that had. Um, he owns the tint team, Fahad. Um, <laughs> he uh, he would bring over like a water reclaim system because I wanted to wash the cars too. So we took care of our guys. You know, right. we, we literally on Friday nights we washed their cars. Um, you know, gave them haircuts. Helped them look sharp. We, you know, we had the tailors come in and, you know, measure them, you know, get them nice suits. They'd go meet with clients, you know, and, uh, and you know, we supported all that. We had everything catered, lunch, uh, Listen, dinner. And uh, this is such a, a vanilla version of what I got when we were in prison. It was, it was, it was, there was a whole bunch of other stuff involved. But anyway, I hear you. It was important you. to us. You know, we... Yeah. we, we <laughs> We, we really iron their clothes. We make sure we everybody used. At night, we had a we had a curse more, jar. More milk and cookies. <laughs> no. But uh, it was it was a nice operation, and it was it was a successful operation because I, I ended up realizing uh, after the beta test that Dave ran, where he actually uh, he launched and executed on some affiliate marketing. You know, the mobile app was live. Uh, you could go on there. We set up uh, relationships with, with different vendors throughout the country um, that would install a high-speed laser printer. They'd print out right on the Lotto Scantron when an order would come in. So they were they were partners of ours. And, uh, and then they would package all, everything up and they'd send it off to LottoNet. And we'd take possession of everything. So once we had some traction, uh, I had done some gold deals in Columbia. So I had these attorneys over there. And... Um, in conversation with one, he said that the lottery was privately owned in Columbia. I think it was called Bellotto. Bellotto? And, uh, and I was shocked. I was like, private? Because, you know, in this in the U.S., you have state lotteries like right. the Florida Lotto, the California Lotto. And then you have federal lottos like uh, Powerball and Mega Millions, which are the bigger ones. And uh, in, in South and Central America, a lot of the different lotteries are privately owned. So you could start a business... And if you obtain a gaming license, you can launch a lottery. Right. As long as you follow the different, you know, requirements, like how much money you have in the bank, the bond and all that stuff. So uh, so as a little pet project in the background, I start pushing. I said, you know, we started 
I started funding these attorneys to go down there and poke around. And we come to find out that uh, that he ended up having a contact in uh, within the gaming commission of the uh, in, in Peru, right? The Peruvian Gaming Commission. So I I tried to force him or you know promote any, some sort of engagement between them. And uh, once they started speaking, um, I mean they were really open to the idea of of us being a part of something down there they put us in touch with the existing lottery called latinka and uh throughout all this and, and and i'll tell you about about the whole model and then uh you know i think it's important to share with you uh obviously you know how anthony comes into the fold right? yeah but uh all this was well, going and royce great. the whole how royce that whole right. relationship uh deteriorates right, right, right. so so at, we're at this stage now where we're starting to poke around down in South America and we start uh, thinking, well, well, we can be a lottery concierge service or, or help these lotteries down there go digital. Because down there, they're very, I mean, they sell lottery in such a primitive way. They have like these ropes and strings. I don't know if you've ever seen it at like stoplights. They have like, like lottery tickets on like, like strings or something. It's insane. They have like reps that go out there and sell lottery. Like, right. And they do good numbers. In Lima, they were doing 10 million a day, right? In lottery. 50% goes in the jackpot and builds it up. And the other 50% goes in the company's pocket, right? So we're at this, we're at this stage where we're prospecting different gaming commissions. And I call a prospect one day that was put on my desk from, uh, from one of my callers. Uh, by the name of Thomas Jacobson, and he's a, um, uh, I think he he ran some sort of ranch in Texas, I believe. And Thomas Jacobson says to me, you know, your proposal looks great, it's interesting, but I don't do anything unless my broker, my money manager, gives me a green light. So he wanted to run it by his money manager. Uh, he goes in and does that, and I get a phone call one day, and. Um, on my voicemail, I hear someone uh, by the name of Anthony Calabope uh, asking me to call him back and you know give him some more information. He had a couple of questions in regards to a lot on it. And typically, there's so many fish in the sea and so many interested parties at this stage of things that you know. You, I mean, I never really. I'm like, all right. I mean, the yeah, guy he wants to do it. Lots of phone calls, lots of emails. Yeah, like, like you hard. know, time management's important, right? So I was like, I'm. A, I mean, typically I won't call these people back. It's like, you know, I'm like having an argument with your broker. I mean, if, if to try to bring another guy, it's like asking your wife if your mistress is pretty. Right. I know what the guy's gonna say, right? Uh, so for some reason, I called him back. <laughs> I don't know why. It was something he said, I guess, that or the mood I was in, and I called this uh, gentleman back, and we. He asked me a few questions, and uh, obviously, what, why are you calling? What are you asking my client to do? What are you asking me to invest in? What are you guys? Who are you? So, so I, uh, I explain everything. We end up on the phone for I kid you not, maybe three or four hours, going back and forth about just all these random things, right? All industry related, and towards the end of the conversation, long story short. Uh, he ends up, we end up coming to an agreement of not only getting his client involved, but then rolling his whole book into owning a piece of this. And, um, and we negotiated his, his payout, you know, his commission structure, finder fees or whatever you want to call it. And, uh, and he became a, a representative of LottoNet, right? So we worked together for the next three, maybe four months, uh, you know, remote. He he was out of uh, Las Vegas, and uh, and I don't know how in depth you got in all that in uh, in the story, but he ended yeah, up. Yeah, you guys. He's funneling some of his customers to buy right. to invest, and then eventually he comes in mm -hmm. to uh, to the the U.S. and you pick him up at. Don't you right, pick him airport. up at the airport or something like yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he uh, he was engaged with. Uh, uh, with a local girl from Florida, and uh, they moved out to Las Vegas because you know he had he had a drug problem, uh, and you know he he had gotten clean, and was a part of like you know the twelve step program like heavy right. into it, and and he just wanted to get away from Florida, so he moved out to Las Vegas, 
he was happy over there. And we really built up a, a solid friendship over the phone, never met each other because he was just, I never met anybody like him. You know, he, he focused a lot of his energy on the same things. He was extremely talented at what he did. And I mean, we were finishing each other's sentences. You know, I know it sounds corny, but um, you know, we would do conference calls with uh, clients and investors and, uh, and we were just really, uh, the synergy was there, right? So I was trying to do everything in my power to get him to move back here because I wanted his energy in there, right. okay? Because, you know, we're always pushing for growth. So he was opposed to the idea. He kept telling me, listen, Florida's bad for me. Right. And, um, you know, just leave it at that. So being as persistent as I am, right, I kept pushing. And I didn't really know that he had a problem at that point. I just figured, I don't know, he just, <laughs> he just didn't want to live here, right? All right. He ends up telling me, and by this point, mind you, three, four months into this, we had raised like probably $2 million, uh, I mean, effortlessly. So he was an asset. So I, I tell him, I basically bribe him to come. I'm like, listen, I'll, I'll get you this, I'll get you that, I'll buy you, you know, whatever you want. You want a car, you want this. And, you know, I mean, I knew the guy's a huge asset. We right. do well together. So eventually he flies in. I go and I pick him up at the airport. And the minute this guy walks out of the terminal with his fiance, I spot him and I was like, I know this guy. I, I, I was sure of it. Like I've seen him before, I've met him before. And it's, you know, obviously industries become small the longer you're in them, right? Right. And uh, when he was getting his bag and loading it in the car, I just I had the weirdest feeling. What I did, yeah, I snapped a picture of him because I wanted to ask around, you know, what I went through with Michelle Braun made me extremely right, like very, hypersensitive yeah. to, to things going on and you know whatever I got involved in. So I wanted to get people's opinion or just know if they you know if they knew who he was. So he loads his bags up. Nice to meet you. Finally, you know, put a face to the name, so on and so forth. They jump in. You know, we're talking. We're uh, you know catching up. We're making plans. And uh, and that's all fine, right? He had a house already. He was renting out, I think, in, uh, in the Delray area. And uh, it just so happens that a tenant of his had moved out. So it was a perfect opportunity for me to kind of push him into not uh, getting another tenant and just moving his life here so we could build together. So I dropped him off at that house. And he's over there. He's, he's repairing things, fixing things with you know contractors and whatnot. Um, the, the next day, our plan was to meet into the office at, I don't know, nine o'clock, say. When I left him, I went and met up with Royce, okay, my partner. Right. And I sat down with Royce and he's like, okay, did you pick the uh, broker up? You know, the guy from Vegas? I said, yeah. And uh, I show him the picture. I said, let me ask you a question, Royce. Do you recognize this guy? And I'm staring at him. And I remember it was yesterday. He he like like literally looked like he was gonna like throw up or something. And then he stares at me and he's like, he's like, what is this? Is this a fucking joke? And I'm like, yeah, you know, I was like laughing and I'm like, what are you talking about? I thought he was like joking around. And uh anyway, I come to find out that this guy was Royce's mentor. And I think 16, 17 years prior to this, uh, he had brought Royce into the industry. And his name wasn't Anthony Calabope, okay? Right. His name was Frank Nuzzo. So in my mind, I'm like, I'm like, here we go again. But this crazy shit, right? right. So- uh, So he's using an alias. Correct. Right. At this point though, mm -hmm. like you're using an alias, right? Like, cause you're, <clears throat> yeah, you're not yeah, supposed yeah. to be working in this industry. Right, I was very scared of, of, uh, of getting in trouble, right? And now I'm not doing anything egregious at this right. point. It's a, I mean, LattleNet is a real company. Um, the we money's were, going where it's supposed to go. You're raising the money. You're correct. doing everything by the books, but technically you don't have a license. So correct. you're using an, an alias. Yeah, and, 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 and you didn't need a license for the structure we had. Okay. However, in my first run-in with, you know, yeah. that whole situation with Michelle Braun, I was banned um, from the industry, right. right, for life which is like 
so aggressive in my opinion because I mean it was one thing that happened and, and whatever it is right. anyway. Well, so here here's what here's Colby. So here's here's what's interesting is that he's using an alias and Anthony's using an alias. They both know they're using aliases. They never address it. They just continue on addressing each other as that. And never, even though the, I, he knows that he knows and he knows that he knows, they never say anything. They just continue on. <laughs> I always thought that was like, it's like professional yeah. courtesy. Like, <laughs> I just, uh, and I, and I wasn't using an alias to, to run away from anything but the fact that I was branded as a, as a, as a bad actor. Yeah, yeah. Which sucks because yeah. I never intended to screw anyone over. I never intended for anything, you know, anything uh, to hurt anybody. Yeah. But no, I don't think that's what I, I don't did. think that's the case. I just think it's, yeah. I, I mean, I, I know that's not the case. I know you're using it because I had a license. I lost my license. I'm not technically supposed to be, you know, doing this. So I don't want it to come up. I'm not planning on, it's not like out you're, right. you're setting up a scam, you know? Right, right, right. So, so, but I, I, I couldn't understand why he used an alias and I just figured maybe it was a similar situation, right? Right. But in any case, I never asked. Right. Um, but I knew who he was. I knew he was real talented. And I mean, Royce had ranted and raved about his talent before I ever even met the guy. Cause you know, we, we had conversations obviously about how we got into the industry, um, you know, who taught us. And, uh, and I always knew that name, Frank Nuzzo, because right. Royce would talk about him. And he knew the name Isaac Grossman, right? Because, you know, we'd share stories right. or whatever. So, so I was like, this is crazy. I'm like, this guy, so now this guy had a falling out with Royce a long time ago. And apparently they were like enemies because they had disagreements. Anytime that happens in the brokerage industry or, um, and you talk about splitting up clients, one's always going to say that the other one robbed them. Right, of course, <laughs> I mean, of right. Right. And he'd shown you. Uh, Royce had shown you his photograph before. Right. That's, and that's why he why you That's why he looked familiar. Exactly. Okay. Yep. So uh, after that, uh, I was already. I mean, I started getting like. I well, just started wasn't getting. Royce already off. an issue? Wasn't he already being? Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, he started. Uh, we were making a lot of money, and he started. Uh, he started just partying too much, going out taking vacations, um, you know, he stopped coming in frequently, you know, he had, he had no schedule, right? He would pop in whenever he wanted to. And I was the one there opening up at 8 a.m., leaving at like 11 at night, every single day. Right. Yeah, I become like obsessive when I do things. And it, it kind of made me, you know, obviously I was a little angry about the fact that we're 50-50 on this and I'm doing every ounce of the work. You know, out of the first round, that 5 million we raised, Royce raised $12,500. Right. And 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 we raise the rest, right? So, um, Anthony has no idea that his enemy is my partner, right? And Royce now knows that Anthony is Frank. So, I tell Royce, "Listen, this is not planned, Royce." I said, "You saw how it happened." I called a guy from Texas, Tom Jacobson. This right. is Tom Jacobson's broker, you know. It's like, what are the odds? I get it, but I have nothing. It's not a fucking plan, Royce. So he says, I don't want I don't want anything to do with him. He said, I don't want him near me. He's like, just tell him to go back to Vegas. So I'm a good partner, right? And I make a deal with someone. I'm going to see it through. Um, and, and had he really wanted that and had he been persistent, I would have, I would have agreed. I would have said, no problem, right? We'll cut him off. But... I told him, I said, Royce, you uh, you haven't done much. You know, I'm killing myself over here. Right. And this you guy's know. bringing in money. Yeah. Yeah, forget it. I mean, he, Royce, he probably made six figures uh, that last month off the guy, right? Off his production alone. You know, he rolled millions of dollars in. Uh, and there were other things too that we were that we were doing and that, that he contributed to. So, you know, I, I I expressed myself and I said, you know, I'm I'm killing myself over here in this office, giving it everything I got, and you know, I, I didn't I didn't plan for this. I have a partner that's absent right now, and that's the first time that we exchanged words about his lack of effort. So he, you know, he's, the guy's such an egomaniac. I could see it in his face, like you know, 
and anyone says anything negative, like you can't give them constructive criticism, right? Right. He thinks it's a personal attack. So he says, I don't know, man. He's like, I don't, I, I really, he's like, he's the devil. He's evil. I'm like, all right, you know. Uh, I kept pushing. He finally says, okay. I say, voice, do not come in tomorrow though, please. Like, let me talk to him. Okay, first, before you come barging in the office and you got to start, you know, throwing fists. So he says, fine, do what you got to do. Because he didn't want to stop his vacation either, you know what I mean? Right. Now I'm getting on him a little bit about not working so hard. So the next day, we walk into the office and, uh, you know, I'm waiting. I usually got there first. I'm waiting for everyone to get in. And uh, Anthony shows up. I'm like, how you doing? I show him around. He's all excited. We had a gorgeous office. Uh, and everyone loved the lounge area, right? It was super cool. And um, we're talking, and then who comes stumbling in? Royce. Right after right. he promised me that he wouldn't come in. So they immediately start like brawling in the office, okay? Like right at each other. And it was a mess. And everyone, Yelling, but not fighting, right? Yeah, no, like even Just, like getting like physical and everything. Like, And then... Uh, but you know how guys are. And that, like an hour later, we're all at the bar having a drink. Right. And they're like, oh, oh man, I love you, you know, and whatever. So Royce from that point on just got worse and worse and worse because he put himself in a state of mind where he wasn't producing. And um, and whatever it was, the substance abuse, uh, you know, uh, the fact that he had a couple of guys around him that were actually, I mean, just, a lot more talented it, it, it really it like shattered his ego and his confidence and um and we like saw it happen you know uh he started because of his lack of performance he actually started bashing the deal and saying that's why i'm not contributing like i don't like this and i don't like that and and there was i mean it was a beautiful deal right it really was we actually went as far as to get um uh, our agreements with Latinka in Peru were to become a partner of Latinka. The gaming commission down there said that we can't uh, have part or take part in uh, the purchase of lotto tickets or facilitate the purchase if we don't have our own gaming license. So Latinka said, we'll buy you out. And nobody wanted to sell because I don't care, 10, 20 million. Is it? I mean, the, what, the, what was... Uh, you know, what was possible was way greater than that. And we were all patient enough to wait. So they said, okay, fine. The other option is, because we do want to do this, because in, in Peru, you have 50 million people, okay? And the vast majority of them have smartphones. A company, Viatel, they built a 50,000 mile fiber optic cable through the whole country and they were dialed in, right? They all had Wi-Fi. Right. Uh, so they end up making a meeting with us to the gaming commission. And now we're now in a, in, in a position right now, right, with all this going on with Royce and, and, and uh, Anthony or Frank, right. uh, where we're in line now to potentially get a gaming license over there. Royce saw all of this and uh, he knew what was going on and everyone knew what was going on. And um, he started just getting really bad, right? And he started feeling, I guess, like jealous of the fact that, you know, Anthony and I were just crushing it. You know, we were doing some cool things um, and and funding a lot of, of projects. At this point, he starts telling people that I'm stealing from him, okay? And by a very good friend of mine, he approached me, he said, listen, are you, are you screwing your partner over? And I'm like, no. I mean, every penny I get, he gets. Right. right? And... Uh, so we get to the point where I kept hearing this thing. So I tell uh, Royce one day, I say, Royce, I keep hearing that you're saying that I'm screwing you over. He's like, no, I would never. No, I'd never say that. So then it gets to the point where he says, you're screwing me over, <laughs> right? right? This guy was a maniac. And then uh, as things go on, the next couple of weeks after that, I keep hearing it from more people that not only am I screwing him over, but he's gonna have me killed. And in my mind, I'm like, this guy's not going to do anything like this. He's like, he's out of his mind. Right. Because first of all, I'm not screwing him over. Second of all, he thinks he's like some sort of gangster or something. And I mean, like you're a broker. Right. You know, relax. 
Uh, you're still, but I mean, you're still cutting him checks every week. Yeah. He's just, and he's is he even coming in the office at all. He's just collecting checks. Yeah, and uh, and a lot of people ask me, well, why would you even do that? But despite how I looked on paper at the time, my reputation locally was important to me because I had a lot of guys that believed in me and that came and worked with me. And uh, I don't care if I make a bad deal, right? You got to see it through and then just tell yourself, I'm never going to do another deal with this guy. Right. So what, what was his beef with this guy? Did you, is that coming up? Oh, no, with, uh, they just with felt. Frank? Yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. They, well, the story behind that was Frank and, uh, this is his real name, Frank Nuzzo. Uh, Frank and uh, Royce, they worked together. Uh, Royce was his uh, junior broker. And when uh, when Royce left Frank, Royce actually, he took some clients with him. Um, and I believe he took clients and did a separate deal without his senior broker's knowledge. And uh, and then he comes up one day and he drops some money on the table, like, here's your share. It's just a dumb thing to do. And he went and did a deal with his partner. And then I don't know, his partner was supposed to believe that, that that was his share or why would you call the clients without me? You know, just a bunch of drama. So... Uh, so then they broke up the partnership and they both attacked the client book and you know and I don't know how many millions they had in the management but it just ended bad you know and uh, uh, that's the whole backstory but from it but uh, now so are we gonna call him Frank or we're gonna call him Anthony what do you want to still confused I which know. one do you want to stick with uh, Anthony Anthony Let's go okay. Anthony yeah so Anthony is continuing to work with us everything's great there. Um, we're now approaching the point where we're, we're about to close out uh, the A round. Right. And Royce is threatened. He's telling people he's going to have you killed. Right. And he's also, he starts becoming a cancer. He would show up in the office from time to time and he would actually start saying negative things about the company. Right. Like how, how it, like it's BS that we had, um, that we were in line to get a gaming license in Peru. He was so uninvolved that these things, to him, they didn't sound possible maybe. So we thought that they weren't real maybe. And um, I don't know, who knows what he thought. But the fact is, is he was bashing the company. Right. Not only are you now not contributing, but now you're making my job harder. Right. So, but you, and you still expect to get a check cut. Right. So that's when we actually did cut him off. Okay. Because now you're, you're, you're an enemy right. to the company. So once that happened, then I started really hearing this, <laughs> that he's going to have me killed. Right. Right. And uh, what I then did, I called him one night because I'm not going to let that linger. Right. You're going to try to solve the issue or, or come to some sort of understanding. Um, and I was ready to go over his house one night. So I call him. He sounded just like out of it that whole day. I remember thinking to myself, like, we might get into a fist fight with this guy. Like, you know, we might get into a fight uh at some point and um i'm on my way over there and uh that night i remember he just sounded off he really sounded like just so fucked up uh when i was pulling down the road i called him and i said hey boy so i'm uh, i'm down the block just give him a heads up you know like open the door or whatever and uh and he said to me he said don't go to the front door he said meet me around um, in the back by the dock. So I'm walking around. But this whole time during the day, he knew you were coming that night. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. He, he, okay. So he kind of had a plan. Yeah. I mean, in retrospect, yes. Okay. At the time, I just, I figured we were going to talk it out and figure something out and I mean, whatever. But um, so I'm driving over there. I call him, Royce, I'm down the block. Meet me around the house. Go in the back by the dock, he says. Right. I said, Okay, I hang up. I start thinking to myself, I'm like that was odd. He said it like he just again. He sounded weird. He sounded. He almost sounded like he was crying or something, right? Like just distraught. So as I'm pulling up, um, I call my girlfriend at the time and I said, "Do you think that this guy would really do some crazy shit? Like, do you think he would try to actually kill me? I mean, what do you think?" And she instantly, she's like, yeah, what are you, stupid? Did you tell her he said, come around the back? 
Yeah. 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 Explain it. And she said, that's shady. She's like, what do you, she's like, turn around right now or go meet him somewhere at a public place at least. Right. So I said, yeah, you're right. I hang up the phone and I call him back and now I'm driving like real slow on the street <laughs> trying to manage the situation. I say, hey, Royce, meet me at the L house down the block. I'm going to go grab a beer. So he says, I have beer. He's like, I have beer here. He's like, just, just come here. He's like, uh, <laughs> yeah. He's like, I'm in my pajamas. Right. I'm like, okay. I said, hey, uh, is Ter- what's up with Terry? I said, I- she wanted to see these these pictures from the Fourth of July party. I'm like, uh, what's what's she up to? He's like, Terry's sleeping. He said, just just come in the back. All right. So by now, uh, I Terry's was like, Terry's girlfriend. Yeah, Terry's his girlfriend. Well, actually, fiance. So now I'm like. That's cool, bro. I'm like, you know what? Just meet me at the L house. Right. <laughs> and he said, uh, he's like, bro, he's like, just come in the back. Come. He's like, come in the back, bro. I'm back here now. I'm in my pajamas. He said, I would never hurt you. He's like, Terry loves you. You're like family to us. <laughs> Who said anything about get hurting? Exactly. What? So it struck me as odd. And I said, listen, Royce, I'm going to go to the L house. Come meet me at the L house. I'll buy you a drink, right? Put some clothes on. Better yet, come in your pajamas, whatever. All right. So he responded and said something like, something along the lines of, come in the back by the dock. He starts, he starts like blowing up, right? Just like a madman scream. Right. That you just, like you know, like what, the fuck is going on here this guy's losing his shit right so uh i was at this point i'm pulling in the driveway right and i had my exhaust was loud on my car and uh i'm pulling in the driveway i hang up the phone and i throw it in reverse and i'm pulling out i pull away and i see him run out in the street right with uh, with his boxers on Right. And he's like flailing. I'm like, what the fuck? Is, this guy's gone. So it's, the whole thing was creepy, right? <clears throat> the next day I get a phone call. And the way it all happened was so fucked up too. I mean, I get a phone call the next day from a mutual friend of ours, <clears throat> uh, this individual by the name of Angel. And Angel calls me and says, Joe, he's like, did you hear what happened last night? I said, no, what? He's like, Royce, he killed your sister. I'm like, my sister? What? I'm like, what are you talking about? So I, I hang up on him. I, I take my phone. I call my sister who lives in Boca. Right. Uh, and she answers the phone. I'm like, Jess? She's like, yeah. I'm like, are you okay? She's like, yeah, I'm fine. Why? I'm here with mom. And I'm like, I was, I mean, I was, I was bugging out. I hang up on her. I call back Angel. I'm like, what kind of sick joke are you playing? Right. He's like, no, no, I'm sorry. No, not your your real sister. He killed Terry. Okay, now Terry's his fiance, <clears throat> and she used to always call herself my sister, right? Because right. me and Royce, you know, at one point, you know, we had a real close friendship. We were like brothers, right? Right. And uh, before everything started, you know, getting going south. So uh, I was just, I mean, I was in disbelief, right? And I mean, immediately I was thinking, he, so he explains everything to me. He's like, he killed her. He There's yellow tape in front of the whole house right now. You can't even get over there. I'm like, how did you find out? He said, um, I, I was blowing him up. I was calling him, calling him, calling him. He didn't answer the phone. So then he called another mutual friend of ours. And this guy happened to be on the phone with her, right, when she was shot. Oh, okay. Okay. And uh, he told him everything. He told him like how it went down. It was, it was such a sad day because I mean she was an amazing human being. I mean the woman she you know she had some hardship early in life and she came up and built a business, a single mother. Uh, I think eleven and nine were the age of her kids from a previous marriage, and uh, she had an incredible business, beautiful house. She was living you know the American dream, and um, and now she's dead, right? So. And yeah, it just creeped me out the whole thing. So the you know the police report, right? And the yeah. the news uh that night like after you left, mm. they got into an argument and he shot her 
couple of times, right? It was a once or twice uh, with an AK-47. Yeah. So the neighbors call. No, no, no. The neighbors didn't call. No, uh, I think he called. Yeah. I don't think anybody anybody called. So Did you hear the recording online? No, I haven't heard that recording. I don't know if it's still there, but I heard it once. So, oh, I, I heard it was part of the uh, part of the news, right? Was it a news clip? I don't know. I don't so, even know how. Somebody found it. I was, so said. he called whether or not she was already dead before he you said, came oh, right, or right. after. I don't know exactly what the time. I think it might might have been shortly after you didn't show up. So I think it was before maybe. You think maybe? I don't know. He sounded so desperate. I mean, I've always thought <clears throat> since that happened, I've had the thought that maybe he was trying to get me there so desperately to say that I killed her. Right, right. They come around the back. Wrestle the gun. Right, why? Right. Right. Terry's exactly. sleeping. Yeah, she's. Yeah. So you come around the back. There was an argument. You were breaking in. You were going to kill him, whatever. Yeah, right. She got shot in the scuffle. <clears throat> Who knows? But yeah. the point is, is that he calls this 911 call and says that that she ended up, um, she pulled a gun on him. They fought over the gun. It went off. Then when they get him downtown and they see by this point, they've got him downtown. They can see the blood splatter. They yeah. can see the the um the powder, the, the, the gunpowder gun residue, residue, everything. They realize <clears throat> she was about six feet away. So he sh- he was holding the gun. He shoots her. So then he changes his story again. You know, uh, the gun went off. She was coming at me. She, she had a knife. You know, it changes like three or four different times yeah. till he eventually breaks down and says, "Right." Then what happened was <clears throat> that he shot her. Yeah. Did he said that there was a? Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. He said that there was, he was cleaning the gun, didn't know that there was one in the chamber. <clears throat> then when they found the gun, there was one in the chamber. Right. But so he said that- <clears throat> It reloaded, he, which yeah. means the clip was in it. Right. He said it, he was cleaning it and the, there was one in the chamber, didn't know it, the clip wasn't in it. Well, if it right. went off, then it- the, It wouldn't reload the cli- the It chamber. wouldn't reload. There was, exactly. It had to be- So that's when they so, caught him in the lab. Right. It was just multiple lies. And, and eventually yeah. he breaks down and says that he, you know, there was whatever, right. it went off. Yeah. You know, she got it. He got it away from her. He was holding it. It went off. You, you know, know I never talked. I've seen the individual that was on the phone with her right. when she died, but I never brought it up just out of like respect. I didn't, I'm sure, I heard he went through some things like after that because he was close with her. Right. Um, but I've always been curious. You know, I never asked him, but, you know, he knows, he's probably the only person that knows what happened. So, other than Royce. So <laughs> Royce gets grabbed. He's not getting out. Like you're not getting bond, right, right, right. you're in jail for first degree murder. So what what happened as far as you know at that point? Yeah, so I was I was not supposed to be in, in that industry that I was operating in. Right. And uh, you know, the securities industry, right? Anything to do with stocks and uh, you know, um, uh, all that stuff. Anyway, uh, at that point, I had a feeling that he was gonna start making it known uh for what reason i don't know to get like a better mattress maybe <laughs> uh but well, he's trying to get out of a life sentence i'm sh- sure he's trying anything at this point like yeah, once they've got you now he's he's scrambling yeah i mean but to think that that would get you out of life it's, I, I mean know. you know <laughs> anyway i mean <clears throat> he did what he did and uh so i, I mean i kind of knew that that something was coming down the pipe i didn't think it would be i thought it would be like regulatory all right I so he tells the authorities <clears throat> he tells the authorities that yeah. you guys are raising money you're involved you're not licensed they're doing right. raises they're bringing in money but he lies then he end up saying like oh it's a ponzi scheme yeah. like he's it's it's bullshit like he yeah. starts saying they're, they're not they yeah. don't even have a license right they right. don't like all the things that he's kind of been saying it but but it aren't true yeah he just starts playing all that up and starts, yeah, just just to try and get. You should put the link up to the gaming commission. It's still active, right. actually. It's actually still active right now. I check from time to time. Just I don't know, right, a habit, I guess. But um, but yeah, all that was. Uh, he he made it out like everything was you know not true, like everything was a scam, and I guess they fed into it. I mean, he was a great salesman when he sobered up, and he had no choice. He was sober in there, and he was probably selling the shit out of him. Right. So, uh, I mean, I knew that I probably would lose the ability to be involved, but I never expected what happened. Right. You know, I never in a million years expected to see that happen. You know, what happened? So So what happened? 
I wasn't in the office one day and uh, I get a phone call from the same friend that told me that 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 Royce was trying or planning or, or was going to kill me, right? Right. And uh, he says, whatever you do, he's like, don't come to the office. And I said, why? What's going on? He said, there's like 40 FBI agents here Right, and they're wearing their windbreakers, running through the office, chaining up everything, taking phones, taking computers, taking laptops, shutting everything down. I'm like, why? He said, I have no idea. So, uh, so I followed instructions. I didn't go in the office, right? I call um, my my other partner, right? At that time, uh, so we had become partners, right? Through you know different deals that we had made. Um, at that time, and he was leading the development on LottoNet. And this um, is David, Dave, right? Yeah, yeah, Dave. okay. And he says, "These guys, they got the wrong place, man." He's like, "This is." He's like, "They took, they took my phone. They took everything." Um, honestly, I don't even remember how I called him, but I was on the phone. But everyone's phone was gone. I guess he got to a phone call, me probably at that time, and um, so we met up, and. I, it's weird. I had a feeling that something like that could happen <clears throat> because, I mean, I've seen how <clears throat> I've seen how law enforcement operates sometimes, and it's uh, you know, if they feel that something's going on, it, it's almost like something will be created. Like Warren Buffett says, if you put a cop on someone's tail for five hundred miles, they're bound to get a ticket. Right. right? So I knew something was going to happen. I just didn't. I never expected that, but uh, it happened. That happened, and then I went to my attorney, and I said, "Tell me the deal. Like, what's going on? You know, where do we stand?" And he he said, "Give me some time," because they dropped a stack of papers like this big, like the SEC. It was regulatory at that point, and um, he said, "Give me some time. My guys will go through it, and we'll tell you, you know, what everything looks like." So, people that don't understand when you say regulatory, what do you mean? So, right okay, now, so it's not. Criminal, right? So you have two. So you basically have the criminal justice system, and then you have the regulatory bodies that regulate different industries. This one, right, being the SEC, the Security Exchange Commission. So they regulate anything that has to do with securities, <clears throat> uh, uh, you know, the equity markets, and whether you're licensed or unlicensed or registered stock or unregistered securities. <clears throat> anyway, the regulatory issues. You can never go to jail for you right. Can, it's you a can fine. Get fined. Right, company can, gets shut down. Right, you can lose licenses right. and things like that. Uh, criminal. I mean, obviously, everyone knows what criminal is. Right. And typically, on a situation like that, uh, the regulatory will lead because then it. I, I'm guessing it saves a lot of work for the criminal justice system because typically they'll review that file and say. Right. Yeah, there's criminal activity in here. Yeah, you know, I was gonna say. Plus, if you go to court on that, they they get to go in and they depositions and do all these things that basically just builds more. You know, most of the time these guys are trying to get out of it, so they're they're yeah. doing the depositions, they're providing this, trying to satisfy the the regulatory investigation, and right. in the meantime, they're openly incriminating themselves. So then, when the FBI says, "Okay, guess what? It's criminal, and we're going to use all that." Yeah. All your depositions, all of these, you know, um, you're still uh, under your Miranda. Anything you say or do, even in there, right? Can you're be done used against you. Yeah. So, <clears throat> so uh, maybe a day goes by, <clears throat> and I, I contact him again. And at this point, I'm like off the grid. I'm like, this is crazy. Right. Um, you're not going home. I'm staying with friends. Stomach. Yeah. You're. Yeah. I was like sick to my stomach, and uh, I get back with my lawyer, and he says. He's like this. Is, he's Not like good. this whole thing is like criminal. I'm like really, and he says, "Yeah." And I read through it myself, right? I just didn't want to believe it. I'm like, "Let me wait to hear the good news, hopefully, or hear that this is a bunch of BS." Um, but there was no getting out of it because their indictment, what they, I mean, allegedly, it was all fake, right? What they had written in uh, that discovery was just completely inaccurate. They said that we didn't have a gaming license. They said that all the money was spent and misappropriated on personal things and uh, luxury lifestyles. Not even the case. 
I mean, look, half the things that uh, that the people around in and around that deal, half the things that pe- those that people had was from previous dealings, right. right? I mean, anyway, it was just like it was frustrating because I know that when you know when the feds go for someone, they have I think it's like a ninety eight percent is it ninety eight percent point. Right, ninety eight point five percent success conviction, conviction rate. Conviction, right, yeah. right. So, whatever but, they thought, and you're not supposed to be there. Exactly, and right. that's why I didn't have a leg to stand on. Right. So I knew right then and there. I'm like, I'm gonna have to take a plea yeah. on this again on something that I didn't do. Like, right. I, something that I didn't. It's like it was the most frustrating right. situation because here I'm just trying to do business, right? And I keep getting involved with the wrong guys, and as a result, you know, I'm I'm having to defend myself, and um, you know, at that point, I I had to make a decision. I was like, you know, we technically, right, we're on the verge of taking over the entire lottery in Peru, okay? Because now going back just a little bit from that point. After Royce had uh, had killed Terry, there was a uh, we had, we had gotten the license, right? So, yeah, I was gonna say there's a newspaper article in Peru about how they gave you the license. Yeah. Like there's a there was a whole yeah, thing. El Peruano the yeah. newspaper. So when when as I mentioned before, Latinka the lottery there, Latinka gave us um, a foot in the door with the gaming commission because we refused to be bought out. So they gave us a foot in the door and they set us up uh, with the whole commission to have a meeting to then get our own independent license to then work uh, with them to, you know, digitize the lottery, right? Right. They were only selling tickets to like Lima, 10 million people in Lima, and they were doing about uh, 10 million a day. Right. So, you know, Peru has 50 million people. Yeah. And mountainous regions, farmland. Right. But they're not in a, in a place to buy lottery tickets, but they all have cell phones. So exactly. they all have an iPhone. So now you've just opened right. it up to right. going from five times five right. five million people in Peru to fifty million people throughout the entire country that can exactly. buy it using their phone, even right. though they don't have a corner store to go to. Exactly. But they do have their iPhone. So Correct. go ahead. And then all while this is happening, we start putting together a global lotto, right? Called Lotto X. And um and we were actually gonna we had marketing um strategies to go into every to go into, you know, all the major countries, you know, all the healthy economies. And we wanted to form a global jackpot. We were having a lot of fun with this whole thing. Right. And um, so needless to say, we get we end up getting the gaming license. But when we got it, um, the gaming commission, they start getting a little personal with us. And they ask us, how do you, how did you get here? Right? Like, who do you guys know in Latinka? How did this whole thing come about? You know, they love the idea. They wanted us to partner. I mean, more right. money for them, right? Um, the sales tax in Peru, I believe, is uh, 18%. Wow. Yeah. And on that 18% figure, if they're doing 10 million a day in lotto ticket sales, that's 1.8 million a day. Right. It's a lot of money for a country like Peru. Um, so we we end up telling them the whole story, you know, how I had an attorney in Colombia I did gold deals with and- you know, he had a contact there and so on and so forth. He's like, oh, okay, so there's no like family relation or anything like that. And I'm like, no, just we don't know these guys, right? Right. So then they open up and they tell us that the uh, the lottery, Latinka there, hadn't paid corporate tax in 11 years or something like that. That they get a lot of money on sales tax. And then at the end of the year, when it was time to pay corporate tax, they were basically like, you know, like, Get out of here. Like you guys, may, you, we dare you to shut us down and lose that almost $2 million a day. Right. It was, you know, a significant stream of revenue for the government. So, you know, they called their bluff. And they were, they were really the only game in town. So the government basically pulled us aside and said, uh, the Gaming Commission, they basically said, um, why do you need Latinka, right? I said, well, they're the lottery. They said, okay, well, now you have a gaming license. All right. They said Latinka is due for renewal on their 10-year license in one year. Right. They said, if we help nourish you guys and help facilitate growth in LottoNet, we, what if we didn't renew Latinka's license next year? Right. So now we're like, 
Sounds great, right? <laughs> like, right? I mean, now we're like jumping for joy because we, now we went from being a lottery technology to actually now considering to, to own a lottery. Right. And, you know, if you look at the numbers, if you're doing 10 million a day with 10 million people in Lima, uh, let's just say you could do 50 million a day with 50 million people in the country, right? If you had, you know, right. if you're in front of all of them. So we start, <laughs> the numbers are like mind boggling. So we can make 25 million a day. If, if we execute on this. So we start moving on all of that, right? And we pull away from Latinka and these guys are all mad. They're all like ex-cartel guys, by the way, that own these things. <coughs> um, and uh, we got, I believe we set up a storefront in Lima. You know, we got the machines <laughs> where the balls would come up and everything. Right. We had the newspaper there. We had to, we had to uh, schedule a time with the news station where they could film the drawing. You know, you can't have a digital drawing, obviously, because then you could just choose numbers that weren't right. picked and you just keep building a jackpot. And anyway, uh, you know, this was this was the point that we were at when... This whole thing went down. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we had to open up accounts over there and, you know, whatever. I'll just leave that for, uh, you know. So, so at this point, you... You go to the FBI and you said, here I am. I know you guys are coming to indict me. No? Didn't happen like that. No? What happened? <laughs> so, my focus was on launching this lottery. Right. Um, at that point, I, uh, I, I scheduled a trip. <clears throat> I asked my attorney if there was a warrant out for my arrest. He said, no. I said, so I can travel? He said, I suppose so. You don't have a warrant. Right. You have a passport? I'm like, yeah. So, uh, so I booked a flight, and I was flying to Ecuador. Your girlfriend's from Ecuador yeah, at the we, time, right? Yeah, we were taking a trip. That seems reasonable. <laughs> I mean, I know when I I remember when I was indicted, I thought time for a trip, time for a trip. It's the logical it's, thing. It's stress. It's a lot of stress. Yeah. It's a lot of stress. <laughs> I get it. I get it. I'm with you. I hear you. <clears throat> so. So we uh, we let me take a little shopping trip, you know, blow off some steam and um, run up the credit cards. I get it. I get it. Yeah. We go to the airport, <clears throat> empty out some accounts. Go ahead. There's a guy uh, that was we're sitting in the lounge, and he was shitting in the lounge. No, sitting sitting oh. in the lounge. Oh my god! I <laughs> say that's amazing. <clears throat> and. Uh, I feel like I'm back there right now. It's weird. <laughs> I haven't talked about this since we sat on that yard. <laughs> right. Walking through the airport. Everything's yeah. good. So I'm hanging out and uh, I'm next to uh, my girlfriend and I look over and I see a guy on the phone and I question myself at that point. I'm like, am I paranoid <clears throat> that that guy is talking to that guy? <laughs> On the other end of the airport, because every time he speaks, he shuts up. And every time he speaks, he shuts up. I'm oh like, it's weird. And I'm watching to see if they stare at me, and they never do. So I'm like, maybe I'm crazy. So I tell my girlfriend, listen, that guy's talking to that guy. She's like, you're going crazy. So I said, I'll prove it. I'm going to get up and walk past them and go get a bottle of water over there at that little convenience store. And you watch them and you tell me if they look at me. All right. So I get up, I walk there. I'm like, I'm gonna catch these guys, right? <laughs> and then uh, I grab a bottle of water. I come back, I'm walking back. She's on a freaking phone. I'm like, I'm like, she didn't look. I know she didn't look. Right. I'm like, did they look at me? She's like, no, you, you know, she's like, you're crazy. To this day, I know for a fact she didn't look. She's sitting there on like Instagram, like posting selfies probably. So just as I suspected, I see both of them there at the same time simultaneously, probably because they're like, well, close one. And I thought he almost walked out, right? Right. They, they start coming, converging, and then they start walking right down the aisle towards me and they close in on me. And, uh, and they say, excuse me, can I see your passport? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> and I gave it to them, and uh, they they said to uh, 
to my girlfriend. They said, you can get on that plane. He's not getting on that plane. And right then and there, I knew. I'm like, this is going to be a long trip. Because what was in that indictment, right. in that, in that, uh, uh, in the SEC discovery, it was not nice stuff. And it was, we didn't have a gaming license according to them. And I want you to post that link because right. it pisses me off. For me to say, you know, yes, Your Honor, I lied about the gaming license. Yes, uh, it was all bullshit. Yes, it was this and accept, you know. Uh, complete, accept responsibility to get right. that, yeah. Because the fear of going to trial and, and losing and then, I mean, doing 20 years yeah. versus just taking five and saying, you know, yeah, I did it all. I'll never do it again. You know, so it is what it is. And uh, they went, they brought me over. They um, they put me in handcuffs and and I never saw the light of day, actually, literally until like 13 months later, 14 months later, because uh, I didn't get to where I met you until, you know, I was in the holdover right over in FTC. Uh, and then when I got there, I just, I'd never enjoyed being in the sun more. <laughs> and I somewhat, I felt free, but it was, it was a shitty situation. So Anthony. Yeah. What sad. happened? Huh? That was sad. Yeah. So what happened with Anthony? Um, and this was how, how this was a few weeks before you got arrested or a few a, months? It was, like, it was like probably a month. Okay. Yeah. So a month before the FBI arrest you. When we really knew it was, we really understood Royce's vendetta. Right. When he killed Anthony. Right. Okay. If you want to just make sure. Sorry. Yeah. So we really understood Royce's vendetta when 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 Anthony turned up dead. Okay. Okay. He, um, I get a phone call from Anthony one day, and uh, Anthony wanted me to come by his house. He had a movie theater, and uh, yeah, they were watching some uh, financial movie or whatever. And uh, you know, this was after Terry's death, so. I went into like a little bit of like a hibernation after that because I felt like it was like a close call with me too because I was I was like there, right? And uh, I just yeah I've seen enough crazy shit that I just really toned everything down, and I was concerned about what Royce was saying in there to uh, you know to the authorities because I was like this guy's nuts, right? And um, I declined. I told Anthony, no, nah, I'm good, right? I'm just going to hang out here in my house, just relax, whatever. I had actually set up a separate office for myself at the time just to stay away from all the craziness. And um, two days later, I get a phone call from his fiance, And she says to me, she said, Joe, uh, Anthony is dead. And I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about? He's dead. I'm like, I just I couldn't even take it anymore. I'm like, there's too much shit going on. I'm like, I thought she was playing around with me or something. I mean, what a sick, like, sick joke, right? And then uh, I said, what do you like? What do you mean? And she tells me uh, that they found him in the bathtub of his upstairs bathroom, and um, and she's like, I know they killed him. I'm like, you know who killed him? She said there was a guy over there that I've never met before by the name of Rico, and. Uh, and this guy knew he was bad news. You know, they were hanging out with a couple of friends and uh, and she's like, he stopped answering his phone and they had those like Nest thermostats. Yeah. So she said they were partying too hard. He was hanging out with this girl and I knew something was going on. I left, I went to my family in Virginia. A day later, he didn't answer his phone, Joe. She says, I turned the Nest thermostat all the way up to like 92. And then I knew if he was there and okay, that she'd see that the temperature go back down. Right? right. She was like baking him out of the house. She's like, but it never went down. And um, when that stayed like that for like a day, she said, I called the neighbor and I told the neighbor they had a spare key to go inside and please check on my fiance. The neighbor goes inside. She walks up the steps and she finds Anthony dead in the bathtub, right? 
with uh, a pillow under his legs, right? And a towel on his shoulder and his arms crossed like this, right? And apparently there was like a bruise or something. Uh, apparently there was a bruise on his uh, chest, right? The neighbor takes a picture of this. And, and and Kate tells me all this. And she said, I said, why would she take a picture of that? Kate's the fiance. Right. And uh, Kate tells me because the neighbor said to me, if my husband was found dead and I was in another state, I'd want to see how he last was, how he was found. At least. Right. I don't know. So she asked Kate, do you want me to send you the picture or do you want me to? delete it right kate said send me the picture so then and she's crying when she's telling me all this and i'm in disbelief and me and i mean we, we built a really close relationship me and anthony i mean i really really genuinely like valued our, our friendship right you know for once it was a guy that he was extremely talented he had no ego right never hated on anyone and was was happy for everybody when 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 they actually you know did something good when you when you, you right. succeeded in something it was like you know you genuinely happy for you and you don't find that that often right yeah. there's always like a little bit of like a uh, like a thorn in there like so um so yeah it was like it was real hurtful to 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 see how that whole thing happened how some scumbag basically you know, took this great guy out, this incredible talent, a great human being. And what made me sick about the whole thing was this guy was such a scumbag that he stole his clothing. Do you remember that? Yeah, yeah, I remember. And like a headset. Stupid stuff. And like, like, like some like bottom of the barrel guy. Right. You know? Also 30, 000, like it was like 30 grand or something yeah, too. Yeah, and then he took like whatever cash he found. Right. And the craziest part is that I heard afterwards that Anthony was actually embracing this individual, yeah, yeah, like no, bringing him into his home, trying to help the guy get his life on track, right? Teaching him things, and you know he always wanted everyone around him to do well, right? And that guy was was Rico. It's what um, his, I didn't know. Joseph, uh, I didn't know who he was at the time. Right? right. Kate, Kate just described him. I had never, and I had no friends named Rico, right? So all I said to Kate was, listen, Kate, I don't even know what to say. I'm like, listen, this this Rico guy, karma's a bitch. Something, they'll get him, right? right? Like eventually, you know, I promise you, Kate, something will happen with him. And, you know, you know, these guys, they don't get away forever, right? There's a lot of technology. And I'm, I'm reassuring her that, you know, justice will be served, right? So uh, at this point... Um, now I'm really like just disturbed by the whole thing. Right. And uh, I actually like really went into like, you know, a little hiatus where uh, that's when I built, I really started like building out the second office. I'm like, I'm going to stay here for a while. Right. right? Uh, after that happened with Anthony. But then as you know, right, fast forwarding a month, I end up getting, uh, I end up getting detained. Right. That day I got detained there in the airport and then they ended up taking me to, uh, to county jail where I spent uh, actually main jail for like a week, county jail for a month, FDC for another year, little over a year, you know, where you have no outside time. Right. You know? So uh, can I, can I mention yeah. something that like, so V, right? So you knew V, there, there was a girl named V. Yeah. We'll just stick with V. Um, so there was a chick named V that knew you and a bunch of the brokers. Uh, that worked for you and knew Anthony mm. and was partying. She was partying with Anthony and Rico. She's the one yeah. that introduced Rico kind of into the situation. Yeah. yeah. So um, she was, she showed up after, after Anthony was found or had died. She shows up. Rico's there. Rico's torn the house apart. Mm. Robbing or who's robbed him. Yeah. And, um, she shows up according to V. Yeah. You know, she tries to call the police. Yeah. Uh, he won't let her. Yep. He eventually basically drags her out of the house, that throws her into her Mercedes. Basically kidnapped her. <laughs> yeah. She has like a Mercedes, right? Yeah. Um, throws her into you know, the Mercedes and then they leave. There's, there's 
login or or photographs or whatever of her coming and going in the Mercedes, like, you know, because I got the police report, right? So right. the police, a day later, two days later, the homicide comes in and homicide calls her and tries to, you know, and she, she won't talk to him. She hangs up. She's scared. You know, she's scared. She knows she was there. She knows they were all partying. She knows she introduced this guy into the right. situation. Right, right, right. So she hangs up the phone, right? And um, doesn't really cooperate at that time with the police at all. She's probably scared of what this guy would do. Right. Yeah. yeah th well, this guy's a fucking maniac. So Rico is, by the way, Rico actually had just gotten out of prison and was in a halfway house escaped or whatever absconded from the halfway house and was hanging out with v and then hooks up with um with anthony and then the whole anthony situation you know falls apart so he's in the middle of just pure insanity i mean he just got out of prison he's going nuts and then there's this you know what i think of what i think is you know a murder you know so that that's where we are right now. Like that's what's happening. So when he, yeah. by the time he gets arrested, <clears throat> I'll take. I'll, I'll, okay, I'll, go ahead. This Sorry. is this is you know right. it's amazing. It's crazy. The first we, of all, it was it was an incredible coincidence that I even met Anthony. Right. We have to mention how you right, how did right. he end up back there again, too. Right, right, right. And then, uh, yeah, no, it's it's important. Yeah, you, I mean, you, you can explain how he got back there. But uh, okay. I, I want to explain. Yeah, yeah, my no. whole my whole take on how my experience right after that yeah yeah it's no no it's absolutely yeah. i just want to say that he how far, how far after the first murder is this probably a couple months yeah, yeah. they're dropping like flies so 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 anthony's found rico grabs v drags her into the mercedes her mercedes they take off a black mercedes in the meantime now obviously he's on a rampage Okay, Anthony's dead. He's robbed him. They're doing drugs. He's escaped from the halfway house or absconded from the halfway house. They're looking for him. He turns around. He starts robbing banks in V's car. So he's driving around this Mercedes robbing different banks. At one point, he even robs a, a, a like a grocery store. And like, like the kid does, like gets through an argument. He tells the kid he's got a knife <laughs> and he tells the kid, I will fuck, you know, I'll shoot you, motherfucker. No, he said, I'll blow your head off. I'll blow your head off, but he's holding kid's a knife. Like, kid's like, no, you won't. And then he goes, ah, and he stabs yeah. him. That was a That's right. right. He did stab he him. He stabs him like in the chest. Yeah. The kid, I mean, he survived. Yeah. <laughs> so this cashier at a, at a grocery store. Poor but, kid. So he's a lunatic, right? But eventually there's a, is there a car chase? And they, they chase him and they, they get him. He, he, he goes. What was it? He 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 hides in a pickup truck. Wait. Oh yeah, he does. He goes on the run. Like he's they're chasing him through. They find him in the road. Twists his knee or something. That's right. They. God, I can't believe you remember this. That's right. He he twi he he twists his knee or something. They, they the cops pull up like he's trying to get himself out of the road or something. Like he's really hurt himself. I mean, he's not not limping. He's hurt. He can't stand up. Cops end up calling because oh because the the guy he was hiding in the back of the pickup truck called the police. Yeah, yeah calls the police. It's similar to that Boston thing, right? Weren't they hiding like a boat or something? I don't know. But the, the cops grab him. And so Anthony, I'm sorry, Anthony. Uh, so uh, uh, Rico gets caught by the police eventually and thrown in jail. About the same time that he ends up in jail. So they're both in the, the U.S. Marshals holdover. Right? That's the United States Marshals Matter holdover. Matter of fact, my first night there. That I get transferred from county over to uh, FTC, which right. is the holdover for the you know Miami uh, for the uh, the uh, the federal uh, prison system in Miami. Um, I was waiting to go to trial, obviously, and uh, the first night there, my my cellmate he's getting a haircut in the uh, in the cell, and you know everyone's like, hey, you know, what's your name? I'm like, oh, my name's Joe. Like, you just get here today? I'm like, yeah. And, uh, you know, my, my cellmate, he introduces himself, the guy cutting his hair. He says, uh, uh, he said, how do you know my name's Joe, too? I'm like, oh, what a coincidence, whatever. And uh, he said, but my friends, they call me Rico, right? Right. And he shakes my hand, and I don't think anything of it at that point. But that's, he ends up telling me everything 
I mean, he, that was the Rico, okay, that actually killed my friend. And uh, it's, it's, it's an incredible coincidence, the fact that I even met Anthony over a phone call from a broker, from an investor in Texas, right? And then, and then now you have the guy that killed my friend sitting in a cell with me. And not only that, I mean, he, he, he goes on and says, well, what are you here for? I'm like, I was a stockbroker, you know, I was involved in some, you know, some private equity stuff and whatever, right? I explained. He says, I used to know a stockbroker. This guy, man, he had a, yeah, he had a really nice house. He had a movie theater, you know, he, uh, he had nice cars, all that stuff. He's like, yeah, we were pretty close. And, uh, like you're starting to figure it out at this yeah, point. Yeah, I was like, "What the fuck?" I'm like, "Like Rico?" <laughs> uh, but I was like, "But I'm like, no, nah, this is impossible." Like, I, I, <laughs> there was no fucking way. So, as he starts, like, I mean, talking to me, um, he then, I just I ignore it, right? I'm like, at this point, I'm just like. You know how it is yeah. when you get in there. It's like your whole world's spinning. Right. So I'm like, just, I can't even think about that right now. And then uh, the next day, we, uh, you know, they do like that pill line thing mm -hmm. where they call you to, uh, you know, people that take medication or whatever. And we had like 15 minutes of like, whatever, it was computer time. And, and then they would do the pill line call. So they call, uh, you know, the pill line and... I just got off the computer and I'm watching like this little TV that I have up there. And I see him, he goes on the pill line and he comes off the pill line and he takes his medication and he sits next to me watching the TV. And he, uh, he starts talking about how he had to uh, collect money for somebody. And he says, yeah, I had to collect money one night for somebody from, uh, you guys such an idiot. He's like from some broker. And uh, he's like, I had to collect money and I had to kill, I had to off his ass, he said. He's like, I took a needle. <laughs> he's like, I, I gave him a hot dose right in the heart. And like instantly I thought back to, to this photo of the bruise or whatever on his chest. And because uh, I remember Kate was asking me about it. And... Uh, and then it clicked. I'm like, it's the fucking scumbag. You know, this is the guy that, def that 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 did this. And then it went on and on to describe it about his movie theater and this and that. And like, he's just like bragging and bragging and bragging. You know, obviously not telling me the guy's name, but yeah, you know, that was Rico. But he also knew V, right? Didn't he mention? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Then he mentioned that, didn't you both end up saying, oh, I knew a chick named V or no? Or yeah, no. yeah, 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 that's right. Because he's like, you look familiar. I'm like, oh, well, you don't. And then he said, uh, I said, uh, he's uh, he actually, he brought it up. He said, uh, I used to hang out, because I told him I, was live, I lived in Fort Lauderdale. He's like, oh, I used to hang out with this girl, V. I'm like, oh my God, definitely him, right? Right. Um, but that was it. And uh, he, he told me some crazy stories. And like, I knew the guy was just, like a scumbag right away. It, it's funny because when we were talking, you know, when we were, we were, I was writing the story and you told me that he had told you about how he grabbed V by the hair. Yeah, and dragged her down the beach. And dragged her somewhere. Well, then when she, when I, I talked to her about the story, she told me that they were in Anthony's house and he had grabbed her by the hair and dragged her out of the house. It's funny how the, yeah, the lies like. Yeah, either she's, either he's done it multiple times to her. Right, like first or, he was the the he was friends with the broker that had a movie theater. <clears throat> then he had to kill some broker. Right, but it wasn't the friend with the movie theater, right? It was right, just a bunch of bullshit. The guy's a he, obviously a fucking maniac. So you end up taking a plea. Yeah, was, you get uh, what? what was uh, it was about five years. Sorry. So, so what was the real reason behind him killing the deaf guy? Okay, so. Initially, when, when I was locked some up, theories, yeah, when I was but, locked up and we talked about it, right, we, we kind of figured that because he had said that the guy owed money. So we, you know, I made the assumption that 
he owed, he possibly owed V money, right? Because he was getting drugs. They were getting, V was supplying drugs to all of them. Well, not so, really. So, no, or what, just doing no, drugs no, with no. them? No, no, no. Yeah, it just, she was partying with the brokers and like, Okay. Really, that's about it. Like just just hanging out with everyone and, um, you know that whole thing. But so she wasn't the, really in a trade or anything. Okay. So the collection, but the collection was when we, when I was writing the story was that he was collecting. Now I guess I had always kind of assumed that he was collecting for V, right? And telling the truth. Huh? Yeah. What? And you assume we assumed that he was telling the truth. We assumed he. Right. Yeah. One, we were assuming yeah. he was telling the truth. The truth saying that he's collecting money because he stole thirty thousand dollars from the guy. So we assumed, or I assumed, he had he had collected money for drugs or for V, killed Anthony and robbed him of thirty thousand dollars and whatever else he scrounged up. Um, but since then, you know, I've spoken with V, and V is like that's not the case. That she had gone off, come back, and she believes he killed him. Now she has a whole theory on that Anthony killed, I'm sorry, that Rico killed Anthony for his girlfriend, Kate, nah. that Kate wanted. Well, that's, you know, that I mean, look, she, she has a, a whole scumbag. theory. He's right. a low level scumbag right. thug that basically saw an opportunity and seized it and has no I, fucking heart, no integrity, no morals. I, I mean, I, I understand what you're saying. I agree. Yeah. But also, I've spoken with Kate. And of course, Kate has a whole, like there's like four different theories swarming around. But the real problem is that the police, even though they've, they've answered, even though they have investigated it, the, the crime multiple times now, they've reopened the investigation that, V, when she was called, like didn't tell them what she knew. She was scared, so she didn't say anything. And all they really have is that this guy died of an overdose. Like that's all they've got. Now Kate's saying he was robbed, but nobody would talk. And so it just kind of died out, right? Like what do they do? They don't have anybody to tell them what happened. And by the time he's sentenced, he actually, uh, uh, Joe actually says something to his attorney. Hey, this is what I, I I just found out. Like this guy killed my friend, and his attorney's like, "Well, don't say anything." Sorry, your attorney's like, "Oh, don't say anything." We want to put you involved. It sounds like you're hanging out with guys that kill each other or murderers or something. So he doesn't say anything. Not that he's trying to say something to get time off or anything. Just that, hey, this guy murdered my friend. Yeah, like the coincidence was nuts. And, and at the same time, for something else. Huh? Did he, when you when you met him in prison, was he in there for? He was in there for uh, several bank robbers. Remember, I told you he oh, yeah, he yeah, escaped yeah. the halfway house and started robbing banks. And right, and not only that, but I thought that, and I mentioned it to my attorney because when he said you look familiar, I was thinking, you know, because V didn't visit Voice in in prison, and she, you know, started like, I don't know, I, I was shocked that she did, but. I mean, you know, friends is a friend. So I was, I was also concerned that that he was contracted. Right. That was right? another theory. That was another theory. Right. So that's why I was like, maybe I should be moved to a new unit. Right. Just like guys, he probably had a photo of me or something. That's why he recognized me. So I was like, I think I should be moved. <laughs> Dude, this guy spent his whole life in prison. He's done nothing. But he wasn't Rico, out six. Yeah. Rico wasn't out six months. He got out and within a month, he walked out of the halfway house, hooks up with V. A complete animal. Yeah. Starts robbing banks, murders or kills somebody, ends up right back in prison. Got 15 years, 14, 14, I don't know, 15 I don't years. Give guys like that, like life. Like, yeah. Yeah. 14, 15 years. Yeah. How long ago was that? Oh, um, 2017. Yeah. No, he's still, he's in the medium. Um, no, he, is he, he's not in the medium, is he? He was in the medium. Yeah. He was he, in the low. And then when he went back, he second, was in the in low. The medium. He was in the low with me. Yeah, so he'd I, actually met the guy. He's actually yeah, I've actually met him. with him. <laughs> yeah. And where's Royce? He's doing life. State prison. Yeah, in the state of Florida. Yeah. Like, I don't know what, what prison, but yeah, he's... So yeah, it's it's like literally when he started talking about Rico and we actually got You're the photo. You're like, wait, I know that like, guy. I know the guy. He used to work out like crazy. On yeah, the, the big yeah, guy. He told me. Lunatic. I remember he did a tattoo for this kid in my unit. And the kid didn't pay him. Kept telling him he was going to pay him, but didn't pay him. I remember he sl like I remember him going 
Oh, uh, where's the money, dude? And he's like, oh, I don't know. I don't know what happened. She was supposed to send the money. Like, it was all bullshit. The kid was just trying to get a free tattoo. And he grabbed him and just, bow. I mean, smacked the crap out of this kid. You know, you know, and he's a big guy, you know, so. But anyway, he got, he literally got released shortly after that. That's when all this happened. And then he comes right back to prison a year later. So, you know, I didn't know who he was at the time. I was just some fucking guy. I just remember the name Rico. But yeah, so he comes back. He goes to the medium. Got 15, got four. I don't know if it's 13, 14 years. 12, the, I think. Was it 12? 12 and, and ended up going, ended up going to, uh, yeah, going to the medium. I don't know where he is now. To the medium, Coleman medium. I don't know if he's still there. Probably look it up. So yeah, it's like it's like isn't it? It's like Joseph Rodriguez or or Joseph Hernandez Martinez. Martinez Martinez Joseph Martinez. Yeah. Um. But yeah. Anyway, so you get how much time? Uh, about five years. Five years. Well, how much time did you do? Uh, about a little less than three. Right. I got a year off for a uh, art after drug program. I got eight months good time, seven months halfway house. Yeah, it's not bad. No. Not bad on five years. Three years, yeah. Huh. Three years, yeah. In, yeah. in your eyes, you didn't really do anything wrong. You just didn't want to risk twenty more years. Yeah. Exactly. No, you can't go to trial. Uh, you know, yeah. Well, I mean, look. Okay, what do you say now? I mean, like, kind of like you know, I, I get what you're yeah. what you're gonna say, but I mean, technically, like. He's unlicensed. L- imagine how this looks. Yeah, I guess. Are you going down for the company or for acting under your other alias or whatever? Right. Like how 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 does it look if he goes to trial? I'm using an alias. I'm unlicensed. I've already been uh, convicted uh, of running a boiler room. I've already done. Uh, oh yeah, I had not a leg of stand on it. No, he, he he can't. Like he can't get on the stand and defend him. So what happens is the prosecutor gets up, says all of these things about him. He can't say that's not true. He can't get on the stand. If he gets on the stand. I'm not a credible. He's not credible. Yeah. You're using a different name. You're collecting a ton of And keep in mind, he is making a ton of money. The jury, th- these are people that work at Tire Kingdom and Walmart. Like They hate him. He's driving a Lamborghini. He's got a Ferrari. He's living at a $3.5 million house. You know, he looks like a professional sports star. You know, they <laughs> he's using a fake name. He's lost his license. He's been convicted before. They hate his guts anyway. You can't go to trial. So it's like, what's the best deal I can get? Because any lawyer is going to tell you, look, I, look, I'm innocent. I don't give a fuck if you're innocent or not. I'm telling you right now, you're found guilty. And I can prove you're innocent. They'll convict you just because you can't say, you can't even say you're, because here's the thing. If he gets on the stand, they can then bring up all of that stuff. Convicted yeah, they felon. Demonize he's, they demonize you. Yeah, yeah. you're done. Yeah, I'd take a plea. Look, I, like I said, if right now the DEA came in and said, we've indicted you for four kilos of cocaine. And I've never seen cocaine. And they don't even have the cocaine. I wouldn't I wouldn't go to trial. How, how much I'd time say, would you do before you went to trial? <sighs> probably probably. I'd probably at, at ten years. I'd probably risk child. Oh, I I do ten. Yeah, crazy. I, I they'd give me they give you would 20, do ten. I do ten because well, well yeah, I, I mean, get the drug done, program. No, I get the halfway. You're crazy. <laughs> That's the, <laughs> because you're going to be twenty five years. How much time is you? I did thirteen, but the first ten years was the hardest. Those last three years they sailed by. Fucking shit. Oh my god, he's like, mm, yeah. If they give me a plea of like eight, he's like, I'd do it. Standing on my head. I mean, I'd be, I'd be hoping for five, you know. But I mean, I've never seen like I've never so wait, seen. So you, if you knew that they they didn't have any evidence, but they're, they're like, they're going to get three guys that are going to sit on the stand right. and say he was involved. I can't Scary, get on the right? stand. I go on the stand. They'd be like, Mr. Cox, how many times have you been in prison? Right. How many times how have you been on probation? Homes did you steal? How many of this? <laughs> We've got four of your victims that are ready to them. Four of my victims. I'm here for fucking cocaine <laughs> that I've never my, seen. He stole my house. Right. Yeah, he did it. He, yeah. He, he, he sold That's the cocaine. It. It's over. <laughs> it's over. <laughs> you just got to take a plea at this point. At this point, I'm at their mercy. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I totally get that. <laughs> Oh, Sorry. Man. No, yeah. Just <laughs> reminiscing. Good times, right? Good times. Good times. I hated that guy, Rico, man. When I met him in there, I was looking at him like, oh, man. He was cutting hair one day, right? Did I tell you about this? <laughs> what? No. I probably, what is it? So 
he kept like he was one of those guys he'd go around the u the cell i mean the unit and he'd be like if he saw you had support on the outside like you had books coming in and stuff like commissary or whatever he'd say to you hey uh i work in the chow hall or i cut hair um i'll cut your hair for free or uh, i'll give you extra food or chicken or whatever um can you tell your family to buy me a book right and naturally if it was someone that didn't kill one of my best friends I'd say, yeah, no problem, buddy. I got you. Yeah. Right? But uh, I told him, <clears throat> yeah, I'll think about it. <clears throat> so then he sees a big book shipment come in one day. All right. So he comes by my by my cell and he's like, yeah, take the books are here. He's like, did you get my book? And I'm like, nah, I'm sorry, buddy. And then I just like started, kept reading. So then he goes like this. You liar. And he slams my door. I didn't tell you this? No. Oh, man, this is great. Listen to this. So so he slams my door. So I'm thinking in my head, you fucking piece of shit. Right. Like, you scumbag. Killing my best friend for a fucking pair of sneakers. Right. Like, you bum. So then I'm like, all right. I'm going to, like, now I'm, like, angry at this guy. So he's cutting hair out on the yard one day. And like with actual clippers, it wasn't like that that razor and a comb thing they yeah. do. And, and so, and this is like I don't even know. It was like visitation was the next day or something. And uh, he's cutting hair on the yard. And they do it like once a month, I think, right? Something like that. Over there. Yeah. So there's a long line, right? It's it's my turn to get a haircut. And when I'm walking up to this chair, I just kept thinking how much I despise this guy, right? And I also kept thinking, this scumbag, he didn't clean the clippers like for 10 heads. And you know, there's like Mercer in there yeah. and like, all kinds of weird bacterial things. You know, you gotta spray the clippers. You're cutting, you're, you're cutting people's hair, like mushing it against their head. I mean, spray the freaking things, right? Right. So when I sit down, I turn over to him, he puts the gown on me, you know, our uh, acquaintance is like a little, little. It's a little strained right now because I didn't get him his book. Right. So I turn around and I say, "I'm like Rico, can you do me a favor?" I was like, "Can you spray those clippers, bro?" And he uh, he looks at me and said, "I did." And I know he didn't spray them. I was, right. I was watching him for like 10, 11 haircuts. So he goes like this. He grabs like let's say like this is the spray. <clears throat> He goes like this. I say, can I see you spray him? Right. So he goes like this. <laughs> so now I'm thinking, this guy is a piece of shit. Yeah. Like he, he almost doesn't, he almost wants to give people some back. To, like he's sick. Yeah. I'm like, there's no way he actually sprayed it. So I'm like, can, I'm like, let me see you spray it, Rico, please. So you know what he does? He grabs the spray. He unscrews the top. Throws it on the ground, grabs the clippers, and he dumps the spray on the clippers. Like, out of, like, anger. Like, like you're questioning my integrity. I'm like, yes. if you only fucking knew, you All scumbag. Right. So then I say to him, that, I'm like, let me ask you a question, Rico. You're like a big baby, huh? I'm like, why are you such a baby? Really, like, why are you crying over this? I'm like, I just asked you to simply spray the fucking clippers. So he says this. I'm not cutting your hair. So he takes the gown off me, right? He rips it off me. And now I'm sitting there like, I'm like exploding inside. So I stand up, right? I go like this. It's so funny. I stand up and I say, then you're not cutting anyone's hair. So I smack all the shit off the table, right? Clippers, like everything, like oil, uh, everything, bro. It's like, And I smack all of it all like, woof. And everybody on the line was like, hey, what the fuck? <laughs> so then Rico's like this. He's like standing there. Mind me, his leg was all fucked up. Right. I'm like, I'll kick like his one leg and fall down. You know what I, mean? <laughs> I mean, he was a big dude. but So then uh, everyone's yelling. And then I'm just like, fuck this, man. And I go up to my cell and I'm like, I put my sneakers on, you know. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, then, uh, and then he just stayed down there. And I see him picking everything up off the ground. I'm like, good, you bum. And that was the last time I spoke to him. And he never knew that you knew Anthony. Yeah. Oh, listen, this the story was in uh this it, it was in um 
uh, the Atlantic magazine, like they reopened the investigation. They called the detectives. They've, you know, yeah, fuck it. I mean, whatever happens, happens, you know, I mean, look, I'm just speaking about things. I'm not like trying to, you know, get like directly involved, but whatever. Ready? Uh, we- so you did your three, like what happens after like, okay, you do your sentence yeah. and then yeah. Oh, he, I mean, we met in art app. We were both taking the uh, drug program. We met, I wrote a story on him. It's on my website yeah. and, uh, we're, well, we were, we were in negotiations with a production company to do a documentary, but that kind of fell through. Yeah. And, um, at this point, you know, you got, he, uh, uh, you got it. Would you get out a little bit before me? It's like around the same time, I think. Yeah, yeah. We were basically about the same. Like, I, I oh, know, yeah. And so, yeah, you got out. The Atlantic Magazine. October. No, no, you got out a little bit after me because you were still in the halfway house when the magazine article came out, right? Yes. Yeah. So he got a few months. Well, I got, I, so I got out in uh, early 2000, uh, 2019. Right. When'd you get out? October. Oh, okay. So late 2019. Okay. So, yeah. so he got out. So, um, and then, and then you started, uh, you started what? You started flipping houses or something, right? You got out and started flipping houses and, and yeah. now you're, um, started doing some real estate stuff. And now that I'm uh, off probation, I, um, uh, I started up a, a brokerage in, uh, cash advance. So it's a commercial financing where we, we, we fund businesses, but we do things a lot different. And I'm enjoying it because it's, you know, it's really, it's the capital formation process where I used to raise capital for companies and ask people for money to invest into them, right? Right. Um, and now, and now I lend money to companies. Right. Right. And but it's all really capital formation. And at the end of the day, you know, we're getting into a lot of different aspects of it, like uh, like uh, like uh, borrowing or lending. Uh, against like intellectual property and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, you know, we do the basic cash advance too, like same day funding where someone, um, doesn't matter if they own a barber, uh, a restaurant or, uh, you know, a law firm. We basically, um, we base it all on their receivables, nothing to do with their credit score. But, you know, we do other products too that rely on credit. What happened to the, uh, the app where the you were developing for the, to check out uh, companies, you gonna do that? Which one? There was an app you showed me. This app, the app that researches companies. Oh, with uh, I'm not sure which one you're talking about. I mean, I had so many projects. Well, I started getting into so many software projects after I raised money okay. for a lot on it. But um, we have a couple of different things going on right now, like uh, the mobile app for where you can get into lending and uh, the compound growth is like incredible. So I want to be able to offer that to, you know, the, the general public, you know, where banks aren't the only ones that can lend and, you know, and compound their, uh, you know, their capital. So people get in for as little as $10, just a cash app that you could buy a fraction of a share. Right. You know, so, yeah. you know, people could syndicate, you know, through a mobile app. Um, but I'm having fun. Hey, I uh, appreciate you guys watching. Uh, if you liked the video, do me a favor, hit the subscribe button, hit the bell so you get notified of videos like this. Leave me a comment in the comment section and sh- you know share the video because it, it absolutely helps. Uh, we're gonna leave all the links to the the Lotto Net, well, we're, to the license. We're gonna leave a lot, uh, one another link to the uh, the actual promotional little video. It's kind of cool. It's super cool, actually. If you're interested in being a guest on the show, uh, we have a form that you can fill out. There's a link in the description. Uh, Also, if you want to read the story on Vitaly, uh, it's called Atonement and it's on my website, InsideTrueCrime.com. I really appreciate you guys watching. Thank you. See ya.